your idea is waiting to be seen. Put it all on display with a beautiful website from GoDaddy. JP will, will admit that. Yep. Okay. We are already streaming on YouTube. Yep, we're streaming. I think we can start. JP pa, ano na lang po yung slide. I'll just share the screen. Alright, so uh, good morning everyone and welcome to another webinar brought to you by the Filipino Science Hub. So this is a special topic for our Filipino Science Hub Research University. Uh, we have Introduction to Analytical Techniques that will be delivered by Professor Dean B. Boyles of Louisiana State University. So again, good morning po sa lahat. Uh, especially, full house po tayo ngayon sa Zoom. And we have around 275. Uh, watchers sa YouTube, good morning po sa inyong lahat. So uh, before we start our webinar, let me just remind you of some of the uh, of our request while we are conducting our webinar. So kindly mute and uh, turn off your video unless you have a question that will be uh, later after the discussion. And please no recording of the session because all of our videos will be posted in our YouTube channel. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, after the discussion, uh, we will have a op uh, an open forum where there will be a 30-minute question and answer session after the lecture. And please reserve your question toward the end of the presentation. You can type it in in our Zoom chat box or YouTube live comment section. Or you can always uh, raise your hand here in Zoom and uh, wait for you to be recognized and you can uh, uh, ask your questions live later after the session. And we will be also providing you with a certificate of uh, participation. Uh, we will post a Google form link to issue a certificate of, of participation for this session. 
in the Zoom chat box and also in the YouTube live comments and also in the YouTube description. We will be posting the uh, Google form link. <clears throat> and uh, please, for you to get your certificate, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and also uh, visit our uh, website www.philsihub.com uh, in order for you to uh, get your certificates. And also, uh, please like and uh, follow our Facebook page for future webinars. All right, so I'll give the floor to Kuya Jeff to introduce the Filipino Science Hub. Take it away, All right. Kuya Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Marty. Okay, um, good morning, everyone in the Philippines. So um, it's actually evening here in the U.S. I'm based in, in Houston, Texas. So my name is Jeffrey Buntin. I'm actually a Filipino scientist um, practicing um, um, research, essentially, um, in uh, the U.S. So uh, for today, I would like to introduce everyone to Filipino Science Hub. So um, I believe that we actually have like a fairly mixed um, set of audience right now. Some are kind of like regulars to our um, online um, events, and the, but I think we do have like a fairly good um, influx of a uh, new audience. So um, I would like to introduce Filipino Science Hub to um, all of you, um, and most more especially to those who are not really that familiar with us. So Filipino Science Hub, so this is actually an online platform that um, um, I actually founded back in 2012. So when I was still, like a graduate student visiting the, Fil um, um, studying in Canada. So um, uh, the main intention of, of this platform initially um, when I started it and when I initiated, when I originated it in the in Batanga City, was that you know we we wanted to be able to mentor um, teachers when it comes to scientific research. Um, but then you know um through time and yeah you know, with uh, what happened last year you know when 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 the pandemic hit um the you know like the the globe and it you know and lockdowns were 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 actually um, implemented. Um, we had to find a way. Um, to adapt this platform um, um, as a means for our teachers to be able to, to adapt um, to the new mode of teaching. So um, what we actually did was, uh, you know, like we we gathered, you know, like a few more of our trusted friends. Um, you're actually seeing like um, um, some of them um, on, on the slide right now. Um, so we have John Marty Mateo from the Institute of Plant Breeding um, from UPLB. We have our JP Onya. Is currently taking up his PhD degree in um, um, chemistry at uh, in Finland. We have Professor Mejon Aguila of UP Los Banos um, Institute of Chemistry. We have Janice Averilla, um, who's a, a practicing research scientist in Kansas, and then Professor um, Ralph L Lauren Alomia from from um, ICUPLB as well, um, um, helping us out actually around this platform. So. Um, Philsci Hub, as, as um, you know, as an organization, has one vision and um, one mission, and that is to promote um, STEM education um, and also the culture of research. Um, if you could go back, please. Culture of research among um, teachers and students um, in the Philippines. So initially, we were just targeting high school, the high school demographic um, um, on this platform. But then, you know, like over the course of doing this, we also um, realized that you know there are some gaps in terms of. Um, uh, understanding of you know key stem areas um that need to be filled and then again at the same time even up uh, at the high school, uh, at the college level um research training is actually warranted and so these are some of the things that we want to actually address you know like you know um these are um um all volunteer activities that we're trying to actually render um the filipino people um um you know um, um and you know this also enables for us to share you know everything that we're learning um, uh, practicing um, careers in the STEM area, um, you know, like with, with everyone um, from, from back home. So if you could go uh, go to the next um, slide, please. Yep. Okay, so so as we have mentioned earlier, we're promoting um, STEM culture and also, um, you know, research amongst uh, Filipino uh, students and teachers. And, you know, that is actually um, geared towards one vision. So hopefully, kami po na mga nagpa-practice ng science sa ibang bansa, Kung naman yung nakikita namin advances sa first world countries, we would like to also be able to, you know, enable the Philippines um, to one day become a, tech a technology and innovation driven country. Because, you know, like um, much of the advances, like in most of these um, first world countries are actually driven by 
uh, the the fruit of uh, science, technology, engineering, you know, the area of you know um, mathematics. And so, how uh, would we actually get there? Um, we can actually get uh, we we, we um, a path that we can we can actually see is uh, by launching a new generation of Filipino scientists. And STEM subject matter experts. So, kaya po ito yung ginagawa namin. We are targeting um, students um, in as early as um, at the high school level, because you know if we can actually plant the seed of passion for STEM, um, I, I think we can um, we can actually influence most of these students to pursue a career in the sciences. And then you know, um, not everyone will become scientists. Not everyone will end up practicing um, a technical career in the sciences, but by participating in some of these um, campaigns that we are offering um, to to the Filipino Filipino people for free, um, you know, everyone will be um, everyone will be able to learn, you know, how to come up how to make um, decisions that are actually based on information. So, you know, we would like to be able to build a wise um, Filipino nation, you know, through these um, um, humble endeavors. And so, like at the moment, we do have like two major programs um, at Filipino Science Hub. The first of which is PhilSci Hub Ed or yeah, Filipino Science Hub Education, and then the other one is PhilSci Hub Research University. And in the succeeding slides, we will actually be uh, we we will be um, expounding on you know what these programs are really about. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me begin with PhilSci Hub Education. So. Um, um, through this program, we're actually trying to um, enhance the competency and you know, um, and to address any knowledge gap that our teachers might have, not only when it comes to STEM subject areas, but when it comes to teaching um, 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 in itself. So um, over the past 10 months, we have actually hosted a number of uh, webinars that are actually um, uh, focused on sharing um, best practices and, and tips um, on how to act, to teach STEM um, virtually or you know from a distance. And so over the course of time, Paul, we have actually gathered uh, Filipino academics from 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 the U.S. and from 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 different parts of the world. We gather them up together, like in in webinars, um, um, where they they share some of uh, the learnings that uh, they acquired from from, from teaching um, in major universities abroad. So uh, we do have a section on, um, in our website that covers all this. You know, we have all the recorded past webinars on um, teaching uh, that you can revisit and, you know, um, take you know, at the comforts of your home and, you know, and whenever it is most convenient to you. So we have teaching webinars. We have um, listed up online resources that you can use and apply for when um, you are teaching um, um, STEM um, subjects virtually. Next slide, please. Um, one of the most recent campaigns for that we launched um, uh, was uh, the creation of uh, teaching modules um, specific in the areas of biology, chemistry, and physics. And we were, we were lucky enough to recruit um, very talented and passionate uh, graduates and students of um, the uh, of uh, mathematics and science teaching um, in UPLB. So we have um, IMG Aguila, Ivy Rituya, and Mark Mark Curtis, um, who all together are um, constructing uh, teaching modules and also problem sets and sample exams um, in these areas that I have mentioned. So at the every day we are releasing teaching modules that our teachers can use, you know, um, as guides for when they teach um, some of the topics that we're covering. So um, please check out all of these materials that we're releasing on our on our um, online platform. So we have we release them daily on our on Facebook, and then you can you can more easily browse over all of our teaching modules and practice problems and exams um, um, on our website. So you know, marami po kami inilalabas ngayon mga material na magagamit po ninyo during the time of the pandemic, you know, like when we cannot really teach face to face, and we have some supplemental materials to help in um, 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 making sure that um, the subject matters are actually delivered um, effectively um, to our students. So these are curated um, by by these three, and um, we're we're all um, also um, looking at uh, make monitoring the content and making sure that they're really creating the impact or making the impact that we, we intend for them to, to, to deliver. Yep. Uh, 
right. I, I take it from here. Uh, my name is JP Onya. I'm the research head of uh, PhilSci Hub. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, PhilSci Hub Research University to everyone. And uh, as uh, Dr. Jeffrey said, uh, this is our campaign to introduce uh, the, the research culture among our uh, high school and co college students. So PhilSci Hub Research University is a free, re a free research training program uh, that we offer. Uh, consisting of uh, eight mandatory courses, uh, which, in, which includes uh, uh, research ideation, uh, experimental design, uh, thesis writing, data processing, to name a few. So uh, this is open for high school and college students. And uh, these will all include the uh, tips and best practices for, for research. And uh, we have made this uh, uh, a very friendly uh, introduction to, to research para uh, ma-introduce lang po yung mga sudyante natin sa, sa mga different aspects of, of research uh, at para matulungan sila, pati na po yung mga teachers natin sa pag-administer ng mga research projects, uh, I mean science research projects uh, to our students. So we already have, um, uh, Kuya Jeff, you, do you have something to add? Yeah, so so it's a long point. one very important also. We encourage the teachers for to take these courses with the students that you're mentoring in research because um wherever you go, um research um is usually uh, research um becomes successful if it if it becomes a collaborative uh, work, you know, between between mentors and students. So if you learn um these best practices and you know, like some fundamental approaches to research, um you can actually um, build on on the dynamic that that you can that that you that you that you initiate you know as you take these courses po. So, um, ito po ay ginawa po namin friendly po sa mga guro at sa mga mag-aaral rin. So, um, ang gusto lang po talaga namin ay eh, hangga't maaari po masu masu ma how do you say that in Tagalog? Um, yeah. is masanay po ang ating mga estudyante na uh, makipag-collaborate sa ating mga teachers. Alam po nila kung ano ba yung uh, notions or, 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 or mga maling akala when it comes to research. Yun po yung ina-address namin dito. Hindi po ito textbook teaching ng research na, oh, you have to follow steps 1 to 10. Yeah, no, it's not that. Very we are, yeah. yeah, we are also infusing um, learnings that we learned from, you know, um, from doing research ourselves. So, ako po, I've been practicing research for about 16 years now. So, ang dami po namin na share dyan na, for example, okay, how do you design an experiment? Sa Pilipinas po, marami po tayo mga maling paniniwala na akala na, oh, dapat pag nag-design ka ng experiment, dapat ganito. Yun po, ikinocorrect po namin yun to make things, uh, to make your lives much easier when you do your research. So, I highly encourage you po to take these courses po. Wala, I mean, these are all for free. And one very important thing po is that we are trying to build, and for JP, it can be, co it can be covering this soon, we're trying to build a community through this program. So, yep. So we have already uh, have recorded or um, undertook uh, uh, already three recorded uh, training courses for Philsci Hub Research University. The first one was uh, uh, for research ideation. Uh, the second one is for li uh, literature review, and uh, just uh, last month. We had the uh, the course number three, which is uh, experimental design, and uh, I would ju I would just like to take this opportunity to uh, uh, like advertise our fourth course, which is happening uh, two weeks from now, um, which is about uh, research how to develop a research proposal, which will be delivered by our by our CEO Dr. Jeffrey Bonkin. So inaanyayahan po namin ang lahat na itake itong mga course na to because these are all free. These are all out on YouTube. So uh, we have devised uh, a Google Classroom for this and uh, we have uh, put all the, descript uh, the description in the, in the YouTube videos. Uh, Pakicheck lang po yung uh, mga video description para po makasadi tayo dun sa Google Classroom because we, there we can access all of the materials for uh, PhilSciab Research University and uh, uh, be able to complete the course kasi bibigyan po namin ng certificate of completion lahat ng uh, makaka-complete or makaka-participate dun sa lahat po ng uh, courses ng Research University which is uh, eight, eight mandatory courses. 
So inaanyahan po namin lahat, mga teachers and mga students, uh, to take part in this campaign. And uh, we all hope to see you in, in our next uh, activities dito po sa Phil Sci-Hub Research University. Anything to add, Dr. Jeff? No, I, I think that's good. That's good. Thank you. Yep. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, apart from the, the mandatory uh, topics, we also have special topics like what we have today. Um, we already had uh, two special topics, which was uh, about nanotechnology and... Uh, and the other one was about uh, all the the, the polymer, heating, analysis. Uh, polymer uh, the thermal uh, thermal properties of polymers. So, yep. ito na po yung pangatlo introduction to analytical techniques. Because um, we we noticed that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of students and teachers are clamoring for for this. Because ito po yung practical uh, analytical techniques that everybody uses for for their thesis or research projects. So and this and this will also provide you guys with a glimpse kung ano ba yung mga analytical techniques na dapat familiar kayo in case you're um coming you're, you're working on a research idea. So if you don't know how to you know, if you don't know how to identify um um an, a suitable analytical method for your for your experimental problem, uh, I think in you. part this might this this will really help you. Yep. And I would like to also to advertise our next uh, special topic which is happening in March. Uh, this research ideas that we can do, uh, that we can investigate at home. And uh, this is very, uh, very, very important, especially in, in this time now of pandemic, na meron po tayong mga research ideas na we can easily do, do at home, na pwede natin ipagawa sa mga sudyante natin. And also, uh, Doc Jeffrey will add on some uh, the the aspects of the brainstorming process. Yep. So this yeah, is happening in like March. Yeah, so everything is, uh, uh, yung pong registration ay nakapost na po sa YouTube and all of our channels. So please uh, keep an eye on that. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kuya Jeff and Kuya JP for introducing the Filipino Science Hub. So uh, for today, our speaker, let me, it is my honor to introduce our speaker for today. Uh our, our featured speaker is Dr. Din B. U. Boyles, uh, Quality and Technical Manager that is based in Kentucky, United States. So, Mom Din B. finished her uh, BS Chemistry degree at UPLB, and afterwards, uh, she became a faculty member of the Institute of Chemistry before going to the United States to pursue her PhD degree at University of Houston. And her research focus is more, uh, is uh, uh, from, is uh, her research focus is detection of molecules and cells labeled with magnetic, magnetic particles using an atomic magnetometer. So uh, she was uh, an assistant professor of chemistry at uh, Louisiana State University in Alexandria, and also a quality assurance and technical manager at a top paint and coating company operating in the global market. She also served as a quality consultant for a biopolymer manufacturing co uh, company and also with diverse industrial experience in env environmental industry, biotechnology, and food chemicals. So, Next slide, please, my JP. So for today, she will introduce you to some analytical techniques that is uh, important in the field of chemistry. So without further ado, I'll give you Dr. Din B. U. Boyle. Ma'am Din B., take it away. Thank you uh, for that very kind introduction, uh, Marty. Um, I just want to congratulate everyone on Fil Filipino Science Hub on your continuing success. So, sana marami pa tayong ma reach in in our own country and all over the world. So, it's a, it's an honor to be here this morning. Um, like what uh, Marty said in the introduction, I will be talking about introduction to analytical techniques. So, let me just share my screen real quick. Okay. So from the title itself, uh, I will be giving an overview of uh, your common, commonly used analytical techniques in uh, academia as well as uh, in 
industrial applications. So just a brief overview of this webinar. Uh, the first section is a discussion of uh, levels, different levels of analytical methodology. And then uh, I will be talking about um, the four uh, commonly used uh, techniques, which are gravimetry, titrimetry, spectroscopy, and uh, chromatography. Um, let me throw some definitions also. Uh, these terms um, you will hear uh, all throughout the presentation. So you have analyte, which is the uh, component of interest in the sample. And then matrix is the uh, remainder of the sample. And uh, here are some examples. So uh, everything that's highlighted in yellow are your analyte and everything highlighted in blue is matrix. So for example, you have lead in drinking water. Uh, you want to know the concentration of lead. So lead is the analyte and then um, the remaining of the sample, remainder of the sample is water. So you have a water matrix. Okay, for so for example, um, your task is to know or come up with a method to determine the concentration of lead in drinking water. So how are we going to approach uh, this task? Uh, this is best approached by uh, knowing the different levels of analytical methodology. So the very first step is to know the available techniques for this type of uh, analytical task. So um, for lead in water, there are many techniques available. And one of them is uh, graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy or uh, GFAAS. And we will be talking about this briefly uh, in the next section of this webinar. But um, uh, de depending on your goals, um, you select the uh, techniques or technique that, uh, that will suit your purposes. But what is a technique? It's any chemical or physical principle that can be used to study an analyte. So in spectroscopy, specifically absorption spectroscopy, it involves um, atomization of the sample and then absorption of light to create the signal for your spectra. So the combination of both uh, principles uh, collectively is called spectroscopy. So now that you have selected your technique, um, the second step is to, to determine the method for, um, for lead in water. So what is a method? It's the application of a technique for a specific analyte in a specific matrix. So the method that you will use for lead in water will be different from the method that you will use if you know lead is in soil or lead is in blood. And um, uh, we use different methods for these because you have different matrices. Because if you have different matrices, that means you have different interferences. So now that you've selected the, your method, then you can write a set of uh, instructions, so specific steps telling you how to carry out that particular method for that sample. So if you're doing research, uh, you can write, come up with your own procedure, again, based on your uh, goals, and, um, and make sure that you can uh, justify the steps that you include in the procedure. But if you're working for um, just for a standard uh, testing of lead in water, there are uh, different procedures available, such, uh, such as the procedures by AFA, or American Public Health Association, and ASTM, or American Society for Testing and Materials. The last level is uh, protocols. So um, you have to ask uh, the question, okay, I need to determine lead in uh, drinking water, but will my data be uh, submitted to a regulatory agency or will it be used for a court case? So if that's the case, you have to learn or you have to know the uh, protocols set by um, EPA, for example, or em Environmental Protection Agency. So if you, um, for the protocols, you have to follow it to a T, you cannot deviate from it. Uh, otherwise, uh, these agencies will not um, uh, will not accept your result. So, uh, protocols include, you know, uh, the requirements for calibration curves. Uh, how do you collect your sample? How do you preserve your sample? Uh, how do you validate results? Things of that nature. So, um, with this big picture, hopefully, um, I was able. Hopefully, uh, I was able to share the importance of understanding and uh, the analytical technique. 
Okay, so let me uh, share with you some common analytical techniques which can be uh, categorized into two broad categories. Uh, the first category is uh, called total analytical techniques. These are your classical uh, techniques. Um, and uh, they are gravimetry or titrimetry. And these, in these techniques, you measure either the mass or the volume. The second group or category uh, are your concentration techniques. So from the name itself, uh, you measure the concentration and normally it's based uh, from, the, from an electrical or optical signal. And uh, these types of techniques uh, require specialized instruments. And sometimes that's why sometimes it's called they are called instrumental. So you have spectroscopy and chromatography. Okay, so let's uh, talk about gravimetry. So in gravimetry, a measurement of mass or a change in mass provides the quantitative information about the analyte. So the general procedure looks something like this. Um, First step is you prepare the solution containing the analyte. And then you would want to separate the analyte from the sample. And then you dry and weigh the isolated analyte. And then finally, from uh, the mass of the analyte, uh, you perform your calculations. So um, here are some of the most common equipment or materials needed for gravimetry. Of course, you need a um, balance. It could be analytical or top loading. And we know analytical is more sensitive than the top loading because it could read up to four or five decimal places. And then you have the sample holders. Uh, you have crucibles, evaporating dish, and aluminum pans to hold your filter. So the crucibles are normally used for um, if you uh, need to heat your sample at, at very high temperatures. And then you need to have a filtration set up. So it could be a gravity filtration set up or a suction filtration set up. So the gravity filtration, obviously from the term, uh, from the term itself, you allow, you let the gravity um, separate the, the liquid portion from the solid portion of your uh, mixture. Where a suction filtration, you um, utilize a vacuum pump to create a vacuum in the flask and uh, it aids in the filtration and making it um, faster compared to the gravity filtration. Of course, you need a lab event to dry your, um, your analyte. If you need to ignite your sample at high temperatures, uh, normally use a muffle furnace. And then finally, you have uh, desiccators uh, where you could cool your uh, analytes especially if they are uh, moisture sensitive. So there are three types of gravimetry that I will be uh, sharing with you this morning. The first one is particulate gravimetry. The second is volatilization gravimetry. And the third one is uh, precipitation gravimetry. So in uh, particulate gravimetry, your analyte is already in a particulate form. So because of that, it's easier to separate it from your matrix. And so therefore the separation step is either filtration or extraction of the analyte from the sample. So one common application um, of particulate gravimetry is the uh, determination of total suspended solids in treated waste water. So in this method, um, you use a glass fiber filter to retain your suspended solids. And then uh, after filtration, you dry it to a constant weight at 103 to 105 Celsius. So this method is, was published by AFA. Uh, it's called method 25, 2540D in standard methods for the examination of waters and wastewaters. And so normally when you do this kind of uh, test or this method, you have many, many samples. So um, it's impractical to just have one uh, suction filtration set up. So normally you would have a manifold where um, you have multiple uh, suction filtration set up attached to a vacuum pump. 
Another application of particulate gravimetry is the determination of crude total fat in chocolate. Um, normal procedure uh, includes ex extraction of the sample with uh, an organic solvent, such as ether, for 16 hours. Then you let the extract evaporate to dryness at 95 to 100 Celsius, and uh, you weigh it. And the uh, last application that I am presenting under particulate gravimetry is the measurement of total suspended particles in atmosphere. So you have a, a high volume sampler with a pre-weighed filter. And uh, normally you uh, collect the air sample for 24 hours. And after that, you measure the filter and the mass of the suspended particles will give you the uh, concentration of TSB in the, uh, in the atmosphere. All right, so that's it for particular particulate gravimetry. So let's move on to uh, volatilization gravimetry. So in volatilization gravimetry, thermal or chemical energy decomposes the sample containing the analyte. Uh, usual measurements are the mass of residue remaining after decomposition, the mass of volatile product collected using a suitable trap, and the change in mass due to the loss of volatile material. So from the name itself, the separation step for this type of gravimetry is the volatilization of the solution containing the analyte. So a known applica application of volatilization gravimetry is the determination of inorganic ash content of polymers in general. I'm just giving Pololan as an example because I've worked on it for many years. So the task is called residue on ignition task where um, you have a sample and you hydrolyze it using hot sulfuric acid and then you ignite it to high temperatures to 500 to 600 Celsius for three to four hours. So the remaining ash is cold than weight. And um, this test method is, uh, you can find it on USP or United States Pharmacopeia in 281. Uh, Pololan is a biopolymer that has film forming properties typically used in making breath strips and vegan capsules. So these uh, particular tests will um, help determine if you're for forming a stable uh, film. You don't want a lot of inorganic, uh, inorganics in your uh, Pololan. Another application of this type of gravimetry is called loss on drying test for drug substances. So uh, this is published uh, under USB 731 where um, you crush at least four capsules or tablets and then you let it dry for extended periods of time under vacuum. So it depends on the mono what's called monograph or what the requirements are for that particular uh, uh, drug substance. But here, you're uh, almost measuring the, the moisture content, but you're not calling it moisture content because in the process of drying, there are other substances that are also lost um, yeah, during, during the, the drying process. All right, that's it for volatilization gravimetry. Uh, the, the third type of gravimetry is called precipitation gravimetry. So in this type of gravimetry, uh, you, you use a precipitating reagent or lipid. Hello? Yeah, we had some kind of, there was an intermission mission number. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Back at you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Welcome for, uh, uh, to those who just joined in. Uh, we're... Yes. So, um, like I said, the uh, precip in precipitation gravimetry, you uh, use a precipitating reagent or a precipitant uh, to a solution containing our analyte. And uh, most method in most precipitation gravimetry, it's a simple double displacement reaction between the analyte and the precipitant. So before you uh, filter the the mixture containing the analyte, you have to add the uh, precipitating agent first. 
And so, for example, you want to measure the uh, percent barium in a solution of barium nitrate. So what you, you, you do is um, you mix it with potassium chromate or, or your precipitant. And what you get is a yellow precipitate, which is barium chromate and potassium nitrate. So these products are based on the uh, double displace displacement reaction between potassium chromate and barium nitrate. So, so Dr. Lindy, I, uh -huh. yeah, I just have like one, um, one I, I guess it's like a very good opportunity for us to emphasize to our uh, student participants that it is like for you to be able to um, design an experiment that would involve precipitation gravimetry, it is very important for you to be very knowledgeable of solubility rules. Cool. Exactly. Thank you. That's right. That's uh, that's so true. So this type of gravimetry is based on uh, solubility rules, just like what Dr. Jeff uh, had said. Thanks for that. So yeah, it's it's a long. Uh, it looks like a long process, but um, once you have the the mass of your precipitate, you can perform what's called stoichiometric calculations in order to achieve the um, your goal, which is percent barium. Uh, as percent weight over weight. So um, in precipitation gravimetry has been replaced by more advanced uh, techniques. However, you can still uh, use it in some applications like uh, assessment of the accuracy of other methods of analysis. Uh, it can still be used to verify the uh, composition of some standard reference materials. And uh, it can be used for a qualitative test, uh, identification of inorganic and organic analytes. Okay, so that's it for gravimetry. Um, so let's move on to the next uh, technique, which is uh, titrim titrimetry. So in titrimetry, uh, what you're measuring is uh, volume. So that's that's what serves as the analytical signal. Some terms that we need to uh, review uh, include titration, which is just the process of uh, delivering a solution of known concentration into another solution, which is called the, the titrant. So the one that has a known concentration is called the titrant. So um, note that titrant normally contains the analyte, but sometimes uh, the titrant or the, the, the one that uh, is, is of known concentration is the analyte. And then another term is equivalence point. So this is the point where um, enough titrant has been added to your analyte. And uh, it's also called, sometimes called stoichiometric point. So physically, sometimes it's difficult to see if your equivalence point has been reached. So most of the time we use what's called an indicator. So it's a substance that changes color in response to a chemical change. So when, when the indicator changes color, uh, that means you have reached the end point. And ideally, you want the endpoint to coincide with your equivalence point. And then finally, you have stoichiometric ratio. So it's the uh, mole ratio between the titrant and the analyte based on a balanced chemical reaction. Common equipment or materials needed include burette, so burette, uh, normally in the lab, we use the 50 ml burette, class A, for, uh, to get accurate measurements. And then for uh, your receiving container, you have either Erlenmeyer flask or a beaker. And of course, you need something for your burette, right, to, to, uh, to hold. So you need an iron stand and clamp. And sometimes your iron stand, iron stand has a white background, which is also sometimes needed for your titration to clearly see the, the first sign of a color change by your indicator. And of course you have uh, the automated titration setup where 
the titrant is pumped into the titrant at a fixed flow rate. And uh, the, the pH of the titrant is monitored as you, uh, as you add more uh, titrant. So this is good if you all, uh, want to get titration curves between the uh, titrant and the analyte. So general procedure, uh, you prepare the analyte and add the indicator if applicable, because there are some titrations that don't need indicators because your titrants are self-indicating. The next step is to prepare your titrant. So you load your solution into the burette. Um, make sure the, the meniscus is on the, where it should be. <laughs> and a part of, part of the titrant preparation is called standardization, where um, you, you determine the actual the, or the exact concentration of your titrant for more accurate uh, calculations. And then you gradually add your titrant to your analyte until the endpoint is reached. And then, of course, you perform your calculations. So at the equivalence point or stoichiometric point, uh, we know that the... Um, uh, the, the moles of the titrant can be calculated based on the molarity of the titrant, normally obtained uh, via standardization, times the volume of the titrant to reach the equivalence point. Once you know the moles of the titrant, you can relate that to the moles, or you can get the moles of the analyte by multiplying it by the mole ratio or the stoichiometric ratio between the titrant and the analyte. And then finally, the end goal is to calculate for the molarity of the analyte. So that's uh, simply the moles of analyte divided by the volume of analyte in liters. Okay, so um, we will be talking about three types of titrometry in this webinar. The first one is acid-base titrometry. The second is complexometric titrometry, and the third one is uh, redox titrometry. So acid-base titrometry, uh, from, from the name itself, you, um, you titrate, uh, it's based on an acid-base reaction, basically. So um, you have an acid of known concentration, and you neut neutralize it with a base of unknown concentration. And the uh, titration progress can be monitored by visual indicators, pH electrodes, or both. So a very common indicator used for acid-based titrometry is phenolphthalein, where um, in acidic form, it's colorless, and in basic form, it's pink. So here's just an animation of um, an acid-based titration with phenolphthalein. And you will see that uh, during titration, you will see flashes of pink. And um, the end goal is for that color to linger or permanent color um, during your measurement. So actually you want a faint pink uh, color. I think this color is a little too dark for an endpoint, but um, that's, that's what you need. Uh, that's what you want to achieve during an acid-based titration. So a typical example of acid-base uh, titration is the um, if you have a strong acid like HCl and you titrate it with a uh, strong base like sodium hydroxide. So at equivalence point, um, you see that you form sodium chloride and water or salt. And based on this uh, equation, we can say that one mole of hydrochloric acid is equal to one mole of sodium hydroxide. So you can use the stoichiometric ratio to calculate for the uh, molarity of HCl. Also with these products, uh, it's safe to say that the, um, the resulting solution at equivalence point uh, has a pH of seven. So um, just like what I mentioned earlier, you can monitor the uh, the progress of titration using those automated titrators um, by uh, monitoring the pH um, based on the volume of titrant added. So 
like I mentioned, a strong acid and a strong base titration will have a pH 7 at the equivalence point. So this is not always the case uh, in terms of pH. So for example, you're titrating a weak base like ammonia with a strong acid, HCl. And based on the, uh, this blue curve right here, the actual pH at equivalence point is below seven. Same applies for uh, if you're titrating a weak acid like acetic acid with a strong base, sodium hydroxide the equivalence point is above seven. So with this information, um, you need to know, you need to select the correct indicator that matches these equivalence point. Because otherwise, um, if you use an indicator that is, that is not within this range, then uh, you will not have an accurate uh, measurement. So here's just a list of uh, acid-base indicators that are also used for acid-base uh, titration. So acid-base titration, um, in general, titration has been replaced with more advanced techniques. But again, you can still use this uh, depending on your the availability of your uh, resources. So one application is uh, the standardization of titrants. And um, this is a determination of exact or more accurate concentration of your titrants. Uh, commonly known primary standard is potassium hydrogen phthalate or KHP. And uh, it's used for the uh, standardization of basic titrants. Another application of acid-base titrometry is uh, your Kildell analysis for organic nitrogen. And uh, with this analysis, uh, there are, uh, some of the analytes include caffeine and saccharine in pharmaceutical products, proteins in foods, analysis of nitrogen in fertilizers, sludges, and uh, sediments. So here's just the basic schematic of a Kildell analysis. So before you do that, your titration, there are a few steps that you need to do. Uh, first is digestion, and then neutralization and distillation. So from this process, um, you recover the nitrogen as, uh, as ammoni ammonium uh, borate, and that's what you titrate against uh, standard HCl. All right, that's it for acid-base uh, titrometry. Yep, Dr. Dendi, um, there's just like one thing that uh, I think we can we can also um, add to to. Uh, titrometry, uh, uh, the acid-base titrometry. So for, for, for all of these analytical techniques that um, Dr. Dindi um, has actually been talking about, it is very important that okay you're familiar with the type of chemical reaction that is involved. And whenever you're doing calculations um, related to you know like a specific technique, you always have to be working on a balanced chemical equation. So you know your the stoichiometric ratios between um, your reactant and also like the products that you are measuring um, in the process, you have to make sure that uh, those are um, um, according to a well-balanced um, chemical equation. So that, that's like one of the points for, for high school students and, and, and college students as well. 100% agree, Dr. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. so. Um... Let's move on to uh, complexometric titrometry. So in this type of titration, um, you involve a simple ion um, that is transformed into a complex ion. So you use uh, indicators and also you can monitor with, uh, with uh, pH. So here's a general equation. Um, Typically, what you your analyte for complexometric titration are uh, metal ions. So, what you do is you add a what's called a ligand to form a complex with uh, with the metal. And like just like what uh, Dr. Jeff Queen said, it's important that um, the equation is is balanced, um, or the equation has the correct coefficients in front of these uh, participating species in a chemical reaction. So a, a very common uh, chelating agent or a ligand is, uh, is called ADTA, so ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. And as you can see from here, um, it's the, the complex 
uh, that, that is formed has like six spots to form a complex with a uh, metal ion. So here's a list of uh, commonly used indicator for uh, EDTA titration. Uh, I'm mostly familiar with calamagite and arrive from black tea. So just like your acid base indicators, uh, these indicators are uh, pH dependent. So take, for example, um, you want to analyze uh, barium ions. So initially, you, the, the barium is bound to, uh, to the indicator, which in this case is the arrive from black tea. And then, um, and then your ED, eta is your titrant. So um, the more eta you uh, add to your mixture, uh, the, the complex um, changes. So the barium becomes more attached to, to EDTA because it's it's uh, a certain amount of EDTA. Um, the complex of formation is more favorable for barium EDTA. So at the equivalence point, um, all the barium that's available will form a complex with EDTA, which is a colorless complex. And when that happens, it releases your indicator from barium and uh, the indicator changes from red or wine red to steel blue. So here's just a picture of uh, what it looks like during uh, an ETA titration with aryochrome black tea. So just like what I mentioned, um, complexometric titration has been replaced with more advanced techniques, but there is still an acceptable uh, test method for um, uh, using this uh, type technique. It's the total determination of total hardness in water with ADTA. So same concept from the previous slide, uh, except your analyte is calcium or magnesium. So as you can see here, your initial color is wine red and uh, at, at stoichiometric point or at, just right after the stoichiometric point, uh, you, you form a uh, steel blue solution. Okay, so the last uh, type of titra titrimetry is a uh, is, uh, redox titrimetry. So in redox titrimetry, um, you involve what's called the oxidation redu reduction reactions between the titrant and the analyte. So that the reaction that everyone dreads. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I know. Like, yeah, there's a bunch of. I mean, this is this, this is the topic of redox uh, reactions and balancing redox reactions. It's something yes. that absolutely that unfortunately most students um don't really like, don't enjoy. So um, you just have to count electrons. Um, this is actually you know <laughs> very, you know it's quite similar to just balancing. Um, acid and base reactions, right? Your 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 currency for acids and bases are protons. In this case, your currency is um, electrons. That's correct. So, because there are some redox balancing redox uh, equations that can they can get complicated. <laughs> it wasn't my favorite in grad school, uh, in college for sure. <laughs> But yeah, uh, we actually have a lecture video. Yeah, we have a lecture video on, that, <laughs> on how to balance redox reactions. So you guys should check that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. But thankfully, I'm just talking about introduction, <laughs> introduction <laughs> to these techniques. I don't need to get in depth in, in this topic. But generally speaking, so uh, in a redox reaction, uh, you have uh, just like what Dr. Urban Queen said, um, your uh, your currency is the the, the electron. So in a chemical reaction, in a redox reaction, um, one substance loses the electron and the other gains that electron. So when you lose an electron, the process is called oxidation. And that means the, the substance got be, uh, was oxidized. And then uh, the opposite is the electron gain, which is reduction. So that means the substance uh, was reduced. So the substance that underwent oxidation is the reducing agent and then the substance that went reduction is the oxidizing agent. So in this type of titration, um, you can still use metal, and um, not metal, but uh, some sort of uh, indicator. But um, sometimes the titrant can serve as its own indicator, especially if the, the oxidized and the reduced forms 
are uh, significantly significantly different in uh, color. So here's just a list of indicators that you could use for uh, redox titration. And um, if you are uh, taking analytical courses, uh, these are the the common redox uh, titration that you will uh, you will encounter. So it's called permang permanganometry, where you use the permanganates to measure the amount of analyte. So that's permanganate is your titrant. Examples of analytes are um, uh, iron, ion, ma manganese, oxalate, nitrite, and uh, hydrogen peroxide. And then, of course, you have iodometry and iodimetry. So with one with an O in the middle and the other with an I. <laughs> um, the iodometry is the indirect titration of, uh, of your analyte with excess iodide. And then uh, you use a starch indicator to determine the endpoint uh, at the end of the titration. And then iodometry is a direct titration of the analyte uh, which serves as the reducing agent, and it's titrated with a standard iodine solution. So, um, like other type of titrations, you have more advanced techniques for, for determining your analytes, your anions and cations, but um, there are still an acceptable method for the determination of total chlorine residual. And so this picture just tells you the color changes during the um, iodometric titration. So you first you form a brown uh, solution, which contains uh, triiodide, and then you titrate it with uh, sodium thiosulfate, um, which converts your triiodide to uh, iodide ions. And then you add the starch, which forms a purple starch I3 minus complex. And then just a few drops of your titrant, which is sodium thiosulfate, uh, will give you a colorless solution. So there are several equations for, for this type of uh, redox that we will not be talking about. But um, again, uh, thank you, Dr. J Jeff, for your emphasis. Uh, make sure your equations are balanced when, whenever you're calculating equations with, uh, with this type of uh, titration. And then another practical application of uh, redox uh, titrometry is the analysis of ascorbic acid uh, by iod iodometry. So that's all I have for the classical techniques. Dr. Jeff, do you want to add something else? Um, I think that's mostly it. Just emphasis on um, balanced chemical equations. So, you know, whether it be that you're doing gravimetry, um, you're, 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 you're recovering your analyte um, using a precipitant um, it's very important that you know the psychometry between between your your analyte and your precipitating agent, and whether it be for acid base titration, um, complexometric titration, or redox titration, um, the heart of everything that you're doing is um, a balanced chemical equation. So don't take those chemical reactions that your teachers are te uh, are are teaching you um, in, in in your classes because that can be your bible for whatever it is that you're doing. Good point. Very good point. <laughs> yep. Okay, so are we good to move on or you need a five minute, do we get to have a break or uh... Yeah, I, I think I think I think we can actually have like just like a, a five minute break for, for people because you know, we okay. have the second half of the okay. talk and for, for yeah for, for Dr. Dindy to also be able to have, have a couple of tips of, of her tea because I know you know speaking for an hour could actually be <laughs> on, the, on the throat but yeah I mean don't, don't drop I mean just yeah I mean like well, we'll, we'll be back in just like in, in five minutes so okay. stay, uh, stay tuned okay hmm. yep yeah so we will have a five minute uh, bio break so if you want to go yep. to the room or comfort room or yeah grab I, I think I, we can, I mean I and I think like during that period I mean like we can even like start answering questions but you might you might be able to answer Marty <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh let's uh let's uh, give it to Mam Dindi who is the expert okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh 
Kuya JP, do you have something to uh, play? Yeah, perhaps you can play like, you know, some video. Ah, oh, is there a video about like, Cells I Have Research University? Yes. Wala? Okay. The one on YouTube? Wala. Naghang ata yung laptop. <laughs> JP. Okay, it's okay. Okay, have, like, so... Have like a uh, uh, good attendance. Good turnout. Yes, have, like, so we have people. around 500 participants in YouTube and 100 here in Zoom. So, a total of 600 plus participants. Thank yep. you for yep. uh, joining us today. Uh, yeah. na yeah, please Jeff. drop your, your questions on... Kuya Jeff, pakipromote yung iyong webinar kasi ay marami pang hindi nakasali kanina nung umpisa. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so, we do have How do I do this? Another way where it's not going to change up the screen. So we do have an upcoming webinar on um, how to develop effective research proposals. So for for teachers out there, both at the high school and college level, if you are not really that confident in um, writing up research proposals, this is for you. And this is also for, for the students. So uh, we will be covering um, some of like the fundamental um, steps and strategies putting together a research proposal um, and not only that we will also be providing tips on how to effectively pitch your scientific idea because you know like the research proposal step does not stop at the writing stage so you have to be able to communicate um, your ideas your objectives um, and convince people that you know um, um, perhaps that, that idea is worth funding um, we will also be inviting people who have had experiences writing up proposals at the high school college and even you know um, um, at uh, At the, at the college level, and then even those who have submitted proposals to the OSD. So, magbibigay po kami ng mga tips kung paano different type of uh, research project. So, that's happening on February 28th, uh, 20th, um, Saturday. Um, so, it's exactly two weeks from now. And then, um, also, um, in the same session, we will be launching Filipino Science Hub Alliance then. So, it is an online competition for the best scientific Uh, research idea. So for SIP, so this is going to be at the high school level. So essentially, if you're familiar with the show like um, Shark Tank, um, this is kind of like similar to that. So um, we are soliciting for research proposals and essentially we will be inviting three scientists like from different parts of the world to actually screen those ideas. And that you know they're um, who we consider our lions. So you're gonna have to present your ideas to this expert panel of judges, and you're gonna have to convince them that yours is actually the best idea there is. And um, we're gonna be giving out a ten thousand peso uh, cash prize for the best science idea. Um, that which you can use um you know to to um fund you know some of your um um some of your research project um expenses. So yun po, marami po kami mga nakalatag dyan. and then also on. Uh, March, is it 22nd party? The one that we have. So we will be running a workshop. So um, karamihan po sa mga teachers and students natin, they don't know um, how to start a research project um, in the middle of a pandemic. So Marty will actually be sharing um, some practical ideas or, 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 or some, some ideas that you can, you can, you can um, explore at the comfort of your home. And, you know, Um, um, come and, and for you to be able to ultimately come up with a research project. And then, yung session ko naman po on the same day, um, i-guide ko po kayo on, in terms of like how you proceed with uh, the brainstorming process. So, paano ba kayo mag-generate ng idea? If you're working as part of a team, how do you screen, say, 10 different ideas from 10 different members? So, where do you start? How do you set criteria, the, the right criteria to pick the right topic or the best the best topic that um, the best topic for a research project. So, yun po yung mga yun po yung workshop na gagawin namin. So, we'll we'll give you some practical guides on how to go about these activities um, that are very critical and crucial for um, starting your research project. So, yun po. Yeah, March 20th yun, Kuya Jeff. So, same. Okay, March 20th. 20th and... February 20th and March 20th. So, yun po. Yes. Um, marami We have... po kaming isi-share dun sa inyo. Yeah, yung NASAT, kailan nga yun? Kuya JP. Ah, ah. Meron, tuloy ba yun? February 27th? Uh, I think so. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we March, do have ano? a couple more special topics. So we have um, Nasat um, um, discussing, I think, is it uh, TEM, um, imaging? So essentially, it's, it's microscopy. We do have a couple of other sessions lined up. Um, so in, in, in March, uh, we will be featuring um, 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 uh, Philippi- an international Filipino scientist in the area of biology. So when it comes to taxonomy and mycology, um, this is like an, uh, one of, uh, like a leading, uh, this is an expert in, in, in the field. So who's also based here in the US. So watch out for that. Um, so we, marami po kami mga nakaplano. And then for those of you who may not have attended the, the first set of webinars on uh, research ideation, on research, of, uh, on review of literature, and also on design of experiments. So though all those um, uh, video recordings are, um, have, have been uploaded on our YouTube um, channel. And then so if you would like to check them out and you know, participate in our training program, so just uh, go to our website. Um, everything is actually there so it's just, uh, we have like a, a fairly detailed set of instructions anyways that's five, five minutes um fast already <laughs> all right so <laughs> we have completed the basic analytical techniques so in our undergraduate chemistry that's uh, the basic uh in organic quantitative analysis now we will go to a more sophisticated technique so these are the modern analytical techniques so uh, I guess Simam Dindi is already here. You can take uh, uh, you can take the stage, Mam Dindi. Okay, we're back. Thank you, Maddie. Um, just like what um, Marty. I'm sorry, not Maddie. <laughs> uh, Marty. <laughs> um, so the next portion of our webinar is on uh, instrumental techniques, which is spectroscopy and chromatography. Um, okay, so spectroscopy. Um, as you can see um, on the animation on the screen, just a second. Um, you see, you have a, a wave on the, which are 90 degrees to each other. So that's called an electromagnetic radiation. It has an electric field and a magnetic field component. So in spectroscopy, that's what, um, that's what you is involved. The uh, it's what's involved is the interaction of matter with electronic magnetic electromagnetic radiation. So there are uh, different types of uh, EMR. Uh, you have radio wave, microwave, infrared, visible light, UV, X-ray, and uh, gamma ray. So it's just a simple mnemonic device to remember the. Uh, the EMR, rich men in Vancouver use X-ray guns, or you can use your own. <laughs> I've just been using this for many years. Um, so in this arrangement, you have uh, the EMR arranged in decreasing wavelength or increasing frequency or increasing energy. So in other words, radio wave will have the, um, the longest uh, wavelengths, gamma ray will have the shortest wavelengths and then radio will have the uh, lowest frequency or energy, and gamma ray will have the highest frequency or highest energy. So in spectroscopy, um, just like what I mentioned, uh, the particle interacts with, uh, with an electromagnetic radiation, and when it happens, something happens with uh, the particle, and it's best described using an energy level diagram. Um, Oops, oops, let me go back. So let me go back. Um, on the uh, energy diagram, you see that um, if the incoming energy or the EMR or electromagnetic radiation um, uh, interacts with uh, the particle at ground state, if the energy is equal to the energy of transition between uh, electronic states, or delta E, what happens is the particle gets excited and um, absorbs that energy, sorry, <laughs> absorbs that energy and gets excited. So the process, that process is called absorption. And um, at the excited state is not very stable. So naturally, the 
particle, we want to go back to a more stable state or the ground state. And in that process, the energy that was absorbed theoretically will be released as uh, energy with the same um, uh, magnitude. So that, that process is called emission. So this is the basic um, principle involved in uh, spectroscopy. General procedure, uh, of course, you need to prepare your sample. Then you introduce the sample to the uh, calibrated instrument. Then the instrument detects the signal from the sample and then signal processing. So take note, the uh, in spectroscopy, you have um, electrical or optical signal related to the concentration of the analyte. Some basic components of a spectroscopic instrument are energy source. So uh, it's either an AMR source. Um, well, you always have to have an AMR source. Uh, thermal sources and uh, chemical sources. And uh, you have wavelength selector, can be a filter, a monochromator, or interferometer. Detectors, which can be photon transducers or thermal transducers. And then finally, you have a signal processor, uh, analog meters, recorders, and computers. And normally, you have a software uh, that processes the, uh, the signal that comes from the detector. The... Um, Sorry. So there are many types of uh, spectroscopic techniques, as you can see on this table here. Um, but we can actually classify the uh, spectroscopic techniques into two uh, categories. So the first one is when there is an exchange of energy between a photon and, um, and a particle. So photon is just a, a, a light particle because I will just briefly say that uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation sometimes behave as a particle. So it's the wave particle uh, behavior of light. Um, so these techniques uh, involve energy change, exchange, and um, the type of energy transfer can be absorption, emission, photoluminescence, and chemiluminescence. Um, because of time, and uh, we will only be uh, talking about um, UV-VIS and IR spectroscopy. Uh, these are the common ones that you use for analytical uh, applications. So you have UV-VIS spectroscopy, atomic absorption, and uh, infrared. And then the other group of uh, spectroscopic techniques is uh, where there is no exchange of energy between a photon and the uh, sample. So the interaction involve uh, Interactions can be uh, diffraction, refraction, scattering, and dispersion. Okay, so let's talk about uh, absorption spectroscopy. Here's a general schematic diagram of uh, absorption spectroscopy. So the first uh, step is the, um, uh, the emission of your EMR from a beam source. So that light passes through a sample, and um, for the most uh, for the most part, this radiation actually just passes through the uh, sample without uh, decreasing in intensity. But when the energy or the wavelength is uh, is right, if it matches the uh, transition that we talked about earlier, energy transition then what happens is the sample absorbs that energy. So when that happens, the light that comes out of the analyte will, uh, will be attenuated or reduced. So uh, the transmitted light will then be detected by a uh, uh, appropriate detector. So generally you, you have a transmission spectra when, whenever you have an absorption uh, spectro, spectrometer, but um, the inverse of that is the absorption spectra, which is uh, which is what we normally use for uh, calculating the or yeah calculating the concentration of the analyte. Okay, so the first type of uh, 
absorption spectroscopy that we will be talking about is uh, infrared spectroscopy or IR spectroscopy. The range is from 780 nanometers to one millimeter. So in IR spectroscopy, um, it exploits the fact that molecules absorb frequencies that are characteristics of their structure. So these absorptions occur at what's called resonant frequency. So these are the fre frequencies where the radiation, the absorbed radiation matches the vibrational frequency. So a requirement for, um, for IR activity is for a vibrational mode to have a change in dipole moment. So a permanent dipole is not always necessary. This technique is uh, commonly used for analyzing samples with covalent bonds. So here are just some examples of uh, vibration modes. You have symmetric and anti-symmetric stretching, scissoring and rocking, and wagging and twisting. So if the vi vibration modes um, upon interaction with the light, if uh, the dipole moment is changed, then um, it is IR active. It, it will show on the IR spectrum. So here's just an example of an IR uh, spectra of uh, formaldehyde. Uh, trained chemists will be able to interpret these peaks and assign each peak um, uh, with the type of the, uh, the bond and the type of the vibrational mode. So the IR spectrometer that is commonly used these days is what was called a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer or FDIR spectrometer. So um, here's a, a simple schematic for FDIR. So remember uh, on the general schematic, you, shot, you let light pass through the sample and then it gets detected. On the FDIR instrument, you, have, you use what's called an interferometer. So what it is, uh, you have an IR source and then you split it into two at a 90 degree angle. And then when they recombine, um, the, uh, if, the, if the phase of the, of the light uh, are the same, uh, what happens is uh, constructive interference, uh, which creates a, a more uh, amplified light. So in other words, uh, in this setup, your detection will be uh, more sensitive. So um, what you get is what's called a time domain interferogram. And a, chem a chemist doesn't really know how to read that. So yeah. uh, <laughs> it has to be converted first using a math mathematical transform called Fourier transform. That's why it's called Fourier transform. And what we can read is the frequency domain spectra. That's what, that's what we can use for, uh, for our purposes. Yep, and th just like one, one, one uh, talking point to, to um, inspire our students, um, uh, Dr. Dindi. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so Dindi talks about um, an IR, uh, she showed an IR spectrum. So uh, one very important thing that our students should, should really have like a fairly deep appreciation of would be uh, Lewis structures and then the concepts of um, polarity, band polarity, because uh, these um, all have um, relationships with the types of the signals that you would actually see. So, for example, typically polar bonds, they would have um, some fairly strong um, responses to IR. So that has something to do with um, the polarity and, and the strength of those bonds. So it's very important that you're very familiar with um, Lewis structures, with bond polarity, and also the different types of uh, functional groups. Um, that would actually respond um, to, to, to photons. 100% agree. <laughs> 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 so here's just more example of, a, of spectra, IR spectra, um, sucrose and glycine. As you can see, I got these from um, NISD chemistry web book. So um, there's actually thousands of spectra available online. And uh, 
you can just download them and then um, use these as like your reference spectra, if, especially if you're determining the uh, structure of, uh, of your uh, compound or, or your, um, yeah, of your, of your compound of interest or your analyte. So just like what uh, Dr. Bunkin said, um, based on the polar bond polarity and uh, Lewis structure, the uh, the bands of these uh, of these bonds type of bonds will show at different uh, frequency numbers. So here's just a list of main IR spectroscopy, spectroscopy bands. Um, you will see that on the on the uh, left side you have the mo more electro uh, negative uh, or more polar bonds uh, compared to the ones on the on the right side, and so on and so forth. So IR spectroscopy is normally used for um, qualitative um, applications. Uh, you can use it to identify functional groups and structural elucidation, um, identification of substances, because these spectra are um, unique to that particular substance. When you're studying the prog progress of rea reaction and when you're detecting impurities. So that's it for IR spectroscopy. Uh, let's move on to uh, UVVIS spectroscopy. So UVVIS spectroscopy involves um, what's called electronic transition. And their usual range is uh, from 200 nanometers to 800 nanometers. So this energy level diagram just shows you the difference in energy transition between IR and UVVIS. And as you can see, IR has a lower energy level transition compared to the uh, UVVIS um, transition or yeah, electronic transition due to UVVIS radiation. And that's expected because from our, um, from our table or diagram of uh, EMR, IR has lower energy than, um, than the UVVIS. So uh, in the UVVIS region, um, so either you're dealing with molecules or atoms, and uh, we're, we'll be talking about molecular UVVIS first. Um, so this requires more advanced uh, chemistry here, but I'm just gonna state it as it is. Um, in molecular absorption, uh, there are allowed um, energy transitions, yes. Um, so here, the, the bold ones are the allowed transitions. You have the pi to pi star, n to pi star, and sigma, uh, yeah, n to sigma star. And what it simply means is your structure should have uh, a pi bond <laughs> or a double bond or atoms with uh, non-bonding orbitals. So the bonds and functional groups that have these characteristics are called chromophores. So here's just an example of an absorption spectra uh, in the UVVIS region, uh, specifically isoprene. So in UVVIS spectroscopy, um, you will uh, encounter what's called Beer's Law. Um, that's not the alcoholic beverage, but it's a last name of somebody. <laughs> um, so here you see the relationship of absorbance and uh, concentration. And so absorbance is equal to negative log of the ratio between the incident beam intensity and the transmitted beam intensity. And then of course you have the optical path length and the uh, molar absorptivity. So these is a constant and then this is based on your, uh, your instrumental design. So from the simple formula, you can uh, calculate or correlate the absorbance with the concentration. And uh, uh, normally for UVVIS uh, measurement, you do you construct a calibration first, curve first, and calibrate your instrument where uh, you have standards and then um, you measure the respond, response, absorbance of those particular standards and then use that curve to, uh, to calculate a, a solution of a known concentration. So here's just a basic instrument 
design for molecular UVVIS absorption. But first, let me just show you a um, uh, what a spectrophotometer looks like from the outside. Um, if you open this compartment, you will see a uh, sample holder and uh, compartment. And then the sample holder usually is a uh, cuvette made from uh, quartz material. Uh, of course, there are more advanced uh, instrumentation um, that is available for, for UVVIS uh, spectroscopy. So your UVVIS instrument could either be a single beam spectrophotometer or a double beam spectrophotometer. So single beam, um, from the name itself, you can only uh, shine light a single beam through your uh, sample holder. And um, so you have, uh, first you have to test the reference, which is sometimes normally a blank, and then you test the sample. So, um, and then you manually calculate the difference in absorbance. On the other hand, in double beam spectro spectrophotometer, uh, you, split, you split the um, the energy source into two. And uh, what happens is because of that, you simultaneously measure the, uh, the, the reference and the sample solution. And the difference is read by the uh, difference amplifier and then you get your uh, signal. All right, so application for molecular UVVIS I have a long list for environmental analysis. Um, you can use it to, to test uh, trace metals, uh, inorganic nonmetals, and organics. So it's a long list, but um, you can just, I guess, uh, uh, review this uh, webinar later on to, to review the list. But I'm not going to go over each one of them. There's a lot. <laughs> um, and then uh, another uh, application is for clinical samples. So you can also use it to test for um, analytes uh, in your serum. So uh, proteins, cholesterol, uh, uric, uric acid, uh, serum, barbiturates, uh, glucose, and protein bound iodine. So UVIS is a lot of applications um, in, um, in many in, uh, industries. So that's it for the uh, molecular UVVIS. The other uh, spectroscopy that uses uh, UVVIS is the atomic absorption spectroscopy. So like what I mentioned very, uh, very early on uh, in AAS, the analyte is first atomized before uh, detection. And there are two common uh, types of atomizers. So you have the flame atomizer and the electrothermal atom atomizer. So this diagram just show, I mean, this slide just shows you a picture of a flame atomizer. And uh, we have a simplified drawing, drawing of a flame A system. So the flame converts your analyte into free atoms and the free atoms interact with the incoming uh, UVVIS radiation. So the transmitted light is detected just similarly, uh, just like your molecular UVVIS you have a monochromator and then, um, and then detected later on for signal processing. And then the other type of atomizer is a electrothermal atomizer. So an example is a graphite furnace tube. So uh, the sample is introduced to a graphite tube, which is uh, heated by resist resistive heating. And with that mechanism, you can convert the, uh, the sample into free atoms and this one, you have more sensitivity because your sample is more contained in a graphite tube. So likewise, you have an incident beam, BAM interacts with your sample, and then uh, the light gets uh, filtered and then detected for further signal processing. So for AAS, um, what's involved is the uh, energy transition of uh, of electrons in atoms or ions. And these bands are um, specific to, to your elements. So take for, for example, your atomic spectra of uh, sodium. Um, these are the wavelengths that corresponds to the uh, elect uh, electronic transition. So 
AES is mostly used for analysis of trace metals in a variety of uh, matrices. And uh, for example, zinc, there, here's just a short, well, it's a long list of uh, matrices um, or yeah, matrix, matrices where you contain zinc and methods have been developed for, for the determination of uh, zinc. So you could use AES if you want to measure not only zinc, but you know trace metals in general, if, if it's in wastewater, air, blood, urine, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is actually a bonus topic <laughs> um, because uh, mass spec is used um, also for, for, uh, for trace metal analysis, also for, um, it's being used in tandem with uh, chromatographic techniques, which we will be talking about later. But in mass spec, so you have uh, three components. You have an ion source, a mass analyzer, and a uh, detector. So what happens is um, uh, you can you have an electron beam source or an ionization uh, source that converts your sample into plasma, which is the fourth state of matter, right? Or I'm sorry, not plasma. I'm getting ahead of myself. These are ions. You convert your uh, your sample into, into ions. And then these ions get accelerated to a magnetic field, and which is, uh, this whole system is called a mass analyzer. So the ions get accelerated and then subjected to magnetic field that deflects the lightest ions the most. So Based on this mechanism, you can separate the, uh, the ions according to their uh, mass. And um, what the detector reads is the um, mass to charge uh, ratio of these, uh, these ions or fragments. So here's a typical uh, mass spectra where you have the mass to charge ratio on the X axis and then uh, relative abundance on the uh, Y axis. So one type of ionization method is called inductively cu coupled plasma. And this is what I was mentioning earlier where um, uh, the sample gets converted to, uh, to, into a plasma or charge, uh, soup of charged particles. So uh, an ICB ha has uh, typically composed of argon gas and energy is coupled to use it to, to it using an induction coil to form the plasma. So this is at high, super high temperature, like thousands of Celsius. And so when the sample uh, uh, interacts with the plasma, it becomes plasma itself. And um, here's just a picture of ICPMS. So um, like I said, the sample is converted to plasma using your ICP before it gets read uh, by the, by the mass spectrometer. So in general, ICPMS is more uh, sensitive than um, AAS techniques. So ICPMS can be used for the uh, determination of trace metals in drinking water, wine, food, and those bound to proteins, analysis of soil samples for crime investigations, and determination of nutrient levels in agricultural soils. So, um, so if you want to select between ICP uh, and atomic absorption techniques, it really depends on uh, your goals. Uh, generally speaking, if you want to go um, to low, very low levels, you want to use um, uh, the ICP method, specifically ICPMS, because it can read up to PPQ levels. And um, if you want to, uh, if you have many elements, if you want to test um, a solution with many analytes, ICP is also the way to go. However, the, the, the downside of ICP is, guess what, the, the, the cost. <laughs> it's more expensive than your uh, traditional AA. So um, if you don't have ICP, um, you can still use, you know, your AA <laughs> spectroscopy. <laughs> you can um, just use whatever you have. Um, and, and Dr. Dindi, um, there's a number of analytical service laboratories in the Philippines. So um, mm -hmm. even 
universities, uh, university analytical service lab laboratories, say, such as UP and, and Ateneo, and, and those major universities, typically they do have um, these types of, of capabilities. That's good. That's good to know. So I think it's just very important for you. Yeah, for you to look to, to look things up. So you don't have to buy. You don't have to buy one. Just, you just need to know <laughs> where, uh, where to look. And then, um, I just have a question. I mean, like these types of guides, you know, um, 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 they're publicly uh, accessible, right? Yes, they because are all. Are, yeah, because there might there could there might be students and teachers out there who are wondering, you know, like when do we know when to use um ICPMS? When do we know um when to use um you know your, your traditional AA? instrument so mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i got this information from uh perkin elmer which is a uh, uh manufacturer of uh, icbms Supplies. so yeah. You, yeah you can just uh, uh type it online uh, you can just uh, type icp versus aa and you can actually see this uh this particular uh pdf file okay yeah Okay, so that's it for uh, spectroscopy. So, um, anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Jeff? I think that the red place is a fairly well covered um, um, topic. Yeah, just, just, just one thing. So, Bindi touched on energy transition. So, fundamentals of trigger. Um, quantum numbers, your quantum descriptors. So, you know, if you have a fairly good um, grasp of those topics, it's going to be fairly straightforward for you to be able to follow or to, to even understand the principle behind principles behind these analytical instruments. Yep. All right. All right. Yes, that's, that's very true. Um, yeah. Um, well, this is so this is introduction, and um, yeah, I left out a lot of uh, <laughs> of basics. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's gonna be it's gonna be too much for an introductory session, and you know, typically exactly. those types of discussions would require very focused discussions of quantum, um, essentially physics concepts as well, mm -hmm. and and you know how they relate um, to these analytical techniques. But then you know, um, I I think. Dr. Dindi has actually been doing a great job of, you know, giving you guys an introduction, you know, like a sneak peek to these types of analytical techniques and instrumentation. So I, I think, you know, like this, uh, this webinar that she's delivered this is uh, recorded on our YouTube channel. So, you know, if there are things that you need to actually, you know, after the session, um, you can just like check this out again. And some 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 of the slides that she presented, we might actually be able to uh, post them on the website. So more specifically, those reference guides that um, she shared earlier. So you know we, we can make them available to you. Yes, definitely. Okay, so everyone's still okay. Um, <laughs> we're on the last leg. Uh, we're talk. We will be talking yep. about uh, chromatography. Um, <clears throat> so. Chromatography is a separation uh, technique. And um, it's where the molecules are distributed between two phases. The two phases are called stationary phase, often is a resin, and a mobile phase or eluent. So the principle behind chromatography is based on the uh, strength of intermolecular forces experienced in each phase. So um, basic principle that you need to remember here is are your IMFA, intermolecular forces of attraction, uh, like your London forces, um, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and so on and so forth. So generally speaking, um, uh, stationary phase, that's why it's called stationary is because it's not moving, it's just stationary. Um, so in chromatography, you introduce your um, sample, the mobile phase is continuously flowing through your, uh, your stationary phase. And anything that is, has stronger interaction with your stationary phase tend to hang out in your, uh, in your stationary phase longer than the ones that have weaker interaction. So in this diagram here, the green ones have um, 
are uh, have stronger IMFA with a stationary phase compared to the blue ones. So the blue ones will show first on your chromatogram, followed by the uh, the green ones. So they don't stay there forever because you have a mobile phase. So you you uh, the mobile phase is like your uh, carrier solvent uh, all throughout the analysis. So it's a very the general procedure is very similar to spectroscopy except invo it involves a um, sample separation in between um, into different uh, components. So there are many types of chromatographic techniques like your spectroscopic techniques, and I will only be covering three of them uh, this morning. So uh, the first type of uh, chromatography is, uh, is based on the uh, chromatographic bed shape. So it could be a column chromatography or a planar chromatography. So in column chromatography, um, it's uh, station the stationary bed is within a, a, a glass tube or a plastic tube. Whereas in planar chromatography, uh, the stationary phase is present as or on a plane. So like your paper chromatography and thin layer chromatography. You can also classify chromatography based on the uh, physical state of the mobile phase. So gas chrome or GC, uh, mobile phase is a gas. And then liquid chromatography is where the mobile phase is a liquid. And the final group is based on separation mechanism. So you have ion exchange chromatography, which separates the analytes based on their respective charges. And then size exclusion chromatography, which separates the analytes based on their size. So let's talk about gas chromatography. So it's a, it's a technique um, for separating and analyzing compounds that can be vaporized without decomposition. So um, I think the maximum temperature, operating temperature for a normal GC is up to 300 degrees Celsius. So if your sample do not decompose at high temperatures, then GC is the way to go. So here's a, a schematic of uh, GC. Um, from the name itself, um, our mobile phase is an inert gas, uh, normally helium. And then the helium gets uh, filtered before uh, it gets introduced into the, uh, the GC system or into the column. And then you have an auto sampler or you can actually manually inject your sample into the injection port where uh, it meets the, um, the car carrier gas. So the sample and the mobile phase um, travels through the column, which is temperature controlled, and then the analyte gets detected. So just like what I said um, on the introduction for GC, um, the analytes are separated based on the, their strength of interaction with the column. So the uh, column is usually a fused silica or a metal tube where you have a stationary phase coated uh, on the inside walls. So um, those that have uh, weakest interaction with the uh, stationary phase in your GC column will get eluded first, will get detected first. And, um, and the, the, the one with the strongest will get eluded uh, last. So the, the, the time of uh, elution is uh, sometimes referred to as the uh, retention time. And you will see that on a uh, chromatogram, a typical chromatogram. So common detectors for GC are flame ionization detector, mass spectrometer, which we talked about earlier, thermal conductivity detector, and electron capture detector. So for GCFID, or flame ionization detector, um, the detector uh, converts your analyte into carbon ions. So how does it do that? Uh, it, you ignite the detector, so you introduce the flame, and then you introduce hydrogen gas to form those carbon ions. And the carbon ions formed are detected by a cathode uh, collector. 
So on the other hand, uh, GCMS, um, we already talked about this, but same concept, the analytes that is being, uh, are being measured uh, get introduced to a mass spec and the, the, the analyte gets converted to, into ions, normally using electron ionization methods. And then the, the mass or the ions are sorted out using a mass filter and then gets detected. So here is a typical chromatogram generated by a GC. Um, you see, like I said, you have a retention time on the uh, X axis, and then it's plotted against uh, abundance of your uh, analyte. And like your um, spectroscop UV vis spectroscopic techniques, um, the uh, you, you need a calibration curve uh, to quantify the um, the analytes in a GC. Uh, uh, analysis. And sometimes you also use what's called an internal standard. So applications, uh, here's, here's a short list of uh, uh, applications uh, for, for GC technique. So you can use it for environmental analysis, like uh, analysis of uh, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and NOx in air. Uh, pesticides and trihalomethanes in drinking water. You can also use it for cl clinical analysis, such as in drugs and uh, blood alcohol uh, analysis, forensics, consumer products, and uh, petroleum and chemical industry. And you can also use it for uh, pharmaceutical uh, products, uh, where normally you want to measure the residual solvent of, uh, of your manufactured uh, drug substance. So that's it for GC. Let's move on to high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC. So the concept is similar to GC, except that the mobile phase is um, a liquid in the liquid phase. And uh, you use a very thin uh, column it's, it's normally packed in a very thin um, col uh, column, the stationary phase that is. And, uh, and because of that, you, use, um, you need to um, introduce your, or you need to operate the HPLC at higher pressure. So um, you, you have an HPLC pump to pump the mobile phase into, into the injector. And um, the sample is also introduced uh, either, you can do it manually, but most HPLCs these days have auto samplers. And then it flows through your HPLC for detection and signal processing. So the HPLC that I'm really familiar with is um, the ones with, from Waters. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, advertising them, but this is just what I've used for many, many times, like hundred times. Um, so if you open this compartment, you will see a uh, sample carousel for uh, auto sampling. And then these are what you, uh, what a typical HPLC column look like. Uh, these bottles are just your solvent uh, containers or your mobile phase containers and uh, uh, solvents for washing the, the system. So in an HPLC system, sometimes you use what's called a guard column to protect your, uh, your HPLC column from uh, any contaminants. Because HPLC columns are actually very expensive. So um, whereas the guard column relatively are cheaper. So if you um, use this as like your filter, then you know the, the, the entire technique, it becomes uh, more cost efficient. So here's a, an example of an HPLC chromatogram. Uh, the mobile phase is usually a, a mi mixture of um, uh, water or methanol, or you can use acetonitrile or trifluoroacetic acid or uh, more commonly known as TFA. And then, um, and then of course the detection is in the UV, uh, depending on your detector, you can, you can detect it at the UVVIS region. So likewise, uh, you can use HPLC for quantifying your analytes based on uh, calibration curves. 
So common detectors are your UV-vis detector, photodiode arrays, and mass spectrometer. HPLC can be used for uh, tracking product purity during pharmaceutical development, detection of illegal drugs in urine, confirming results of synthesis reactions for research. Uh, very specific application is the analysis of vitamin D in plasma for clinical studies. Determination of floxetine in serum and uh, determination of PAH in wastewater. So generally speaking, if your um, if your analyte if your solution is um, less volatile, HPLC is the way to go. So uh, like salts, um, inorganics, um, and uh, more complicated structures, uh, HPLC is usually the way to go, not not GC. So just one, another application is uh, analysis of CBD, which is uh, pretty popular these days. And um, here's just an example of a CBD profile where uh, you want to measure the amount of CBD in your is isolate. You want to make sure that your THC levels are either uh, non-detect or accept within acceptable limits. And of course, we know that CBD is the cousin of THC, which is found in um, marijuana. So that's it for HPLC. The final, final type of technique that I'll be talking about is size exclusion chromatography. Dr. Jeff, do you have, do you have anything to add before I talk about size ex exclusion? Yeah, it was just, just kind of like a, an icebreaker for the, for the benefit of those students. So like, you know, um, if you are, have not really practiced chromatography or if this is the very first time that you've encountered chromatography, um, you can actually make, um, you can actually use your friends um, for an analogy for, for how chromatography works, right? So Dindi said earlier that the rate or, you know, like, the, the, like how fast a particular um, analyte would um, course through the column you know, down to the detector. It depends on the strength of the interaction of your analyte to your to your um, stationary phase or your your um, your column. So sa mga kaibigan nyo, meron kayong clean <laughs> na friend. So yung dikit ng dikit sa inyo, yun, wala masyadong mapupuntahan yun kasi dikit lang yun sa inyo. Pero meron din kayong friend who don't care na walang pa kayo, iwanan kayo. So yun yung mga mabibilis maka, makadaan sa column. So dun sa um, GC, GC uh, chrom chromatogram that din they showed, those that have shorter retention times, those are the ones that don't care. They don't stick to the um, stationary phase. So yun yung mga walang pa kanyang friends. Pero yung mababagal, yung dumidikit sa inyo, those are the ones that typically um, show up at a, a, a longer retention time. That's and correct. Then, as she said, yeah, as she said, um, as din they said, intermolecular forces of attraction. So again, polarity. Um, um, materials with the same polarity would have stronger attraction. So if your mobile, if your stationary phase is polar, then all your polar molecules will stick to them. So yung mga non-polar, sila yung mga walang pake. But That's if right. the situation reverses, if you have a non-polar um, um, stationary phase, all your non-polars would stick more strongly, and then yung polar nyo, sila naman yung unang a. That's so correct. That's how you... you these are not really very complicated. So, yeah. but, and thanks for sharing all these, um, um, Dr. Dindi. Yeah. Uh, let me just add, Kuya Jeff, no? Kung gusto talaga nilang makita visually yung chromatography, pwede silang mag-try ng paper chromatography sa bahay. So, and yeah, just... use your, use your um, pen ink. Your ink, the ink of your yeah. pen. <laughs> yeah. Pwede yung gamitin. Uh, siguro 70% alcohol. Siguro volatile na yun enough, no? Para mag-travel sa yeah. paper. Yeah. And but, even, but... I mean, water will be quite 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 slow but you know yes. it could also work but and then so um you, yeah that's an experiment that you can do at home just like you know mag dot lang po kayo sa papel and then kung meron kayong solvent dyan, whether it be water or, or acetone um anything that you you have at home um i realize you po yung color below yun na ink hindi po talaga yung blue there's a lot yeah. of components components that's it. right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and it's, it's important to cover it para uh 
Yeah. So, ilalagay nyo po siya sa isang container na covered, tapos wait nyo po siya hanggang mag-travel yung water hanggang sa dulo ng paper. Yeah. And you will see that there are a lot of components in that ink. So, yung natitira po sa may bandang dulo, ibig sabi, or nandun sa pinakababa, ibig sabihin yun yung hindi nadadala ng inyong mobile face. Tama ba, Ma'am Bindi? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Ayan. Tapos yung mga nasa pinakataas, sila yung nadadala ng mobile face nyo. So yun po, pwede nyo pwede, pwede pong i-picture ang chromatography sa inyong bahay using paper yeah. chromatography. So I actually had a slide for paper chrome, but I just uh, left it out for time's sake. We can post those slides on the website. Um, yes. The bonus. So, thanks yes. to Dr. Dindi. She actually had put like together, I had put together, you know, like a very comprehensive slide deck um, for, for yeah. the benefit of those who are interested now in, yeah. this, in this talk. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a truncated version. Otherwise, we'll be here for <laughs> another yeah, hour. For so. Three hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so... Final, final round <laughs> is the uh, size exclusion chromatography. So, so it's also known as the uh, molecular sieve or gel permeation chromatography or GPC. So the separation depends on the ability of the uh, analyze to enter into the force, pores of the stationary phase. So just here in this uh, diagram here, um, you will, see, you will see that a solution will contain small molecules and large molecules. So the small molecules um, can get into the what's called molecular sieves or porous beads. So they will stay longer in the stationary phase and the large molecules will just be eluted first. And um, of course you have a mobile phase that um, that continues to flow through the uh, column. So this type of uh, chromatography is, uh, the setup is similar to HPLC, but you're just using uh, different types of columns or columns that contains those uh, molecular sieves. So here's just a list of the, um, the columns that you can use for uh, size exclusion chromatography. Common detectors include UV-Vis detector, refractive index, and multi-angle light scattering. So here, the um, analytes that have higher molecular weight will have uh, uh, faster retention time. And then the ones that have lower molecular weight will have the, the uh, slower retention time. So they will show up on the peaks later on. So some applications include measuring both the size and polydispersity of a synthesized polymer absolute molecular weight measurements when used in tandem with a viscometer. And then you can actually use this to analyze uh, protein structures such as the tertiary and quaternary structure of proteins. So to summarize, um, a technique is any chemical or physical principle that we can use to study an analyte. So two broad categories are classical and instrumental. Gravimetry is a technique that measures mass or change in mass to provide the quantitative information of the analyte in the sample. So there were three types of gravimetry covered in this webinar, the particular gravimetry, volatilization gravimetry, and precipitation gravimetry. You also have titrimetry, which is an analytical technique which involves volume as the analytical signal. So you have acid base, complexometric, and redox titrimetry. We also cover spectroscopy, which is due to the interaction of matter and electromagnetic radiation. And the most common, commonly used techniques involve absorption of energy. So we covered IR spectroscopy, uv spectroscopy, and atomic absorption spectroscopy. Chromatography is a separation technique due to intermolecular forces of attraction differences between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. The common techniques are gas chromatography, HPLC and size exclusion chromatography. And finally, you, we noticed that analytical techniques are quite useful in several industries such as environmental, food, pharmaceutical, research, petrochemical, forensic science, clinical studies, et cetera, et cetera. So my main reference for this webinar is listed on the screen. It's a free ebook by Dr. Harvey.
And that's it. So I guess we can now open to Q&A. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Dindi. Uh, can we give her a virtual clap here in Zoom and also in YouTube? Sobrang tagal nun, that's around two hours. So this is a very good uh, introduction to analytical techniques, conventional and modern analytical techniques that you can use actually, especially when you will take the board exam. So if you, if you want to refresh your memory about uh, analytical techniques, this is a very good lecture for that. So uh, we have a lot of questions, but for the speaker's uh, information, uh, our viewers are well represented. So we have some, uh, someone from the north. May nakita po ako sa YouTube na from MMSU, that's Ilocos Region, Mariano Marcos State University. We have uh, a class from Visayas. Ang dami po nilang taga Eastern Visayas State University from Tacloban. And meron din isang class from NDMU, Notre Dame of Marble University in Coronadal City. So isang class po sila. Magkakaklase sila dun sa YouTube, nag interact So hello po sa inyo. Thank you for participating in our webinar. So we have a lot of questions in YouTube. Uh, also, if you want to ask live questions here in Zoom, you can press the raise your hand button. So I'll start with the questions in YouTube, uh, Ma'am Dindi. Uh, uh -oh. Can you expand on the concept of equivalence point versus endpoint and how a proper choice of chemical in indicator can be made? So interchangeable means an itong equivalence point and endpoint. Can you give us uh, yung uh, expand on the concept of these two uh, two two uh, concept? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Equivalence point is yung ano, no, stoichiometric ratio. So it's based on your uh, balanced chemical equation, just like what Dr. Bunkin said. So it's a, it's a theoretically determined. Whereas the end point um, is based on, normally um, you use those indicators that change, uh, uh, the change colors or, um, yeah, the change colors upon ch uh, chemical reaction. So, um, so normally, the during titration, the pH changes, right? So um, because of that pH change, the indicator color also changes, and each color, uh, each indicator has specific pH range. So, for example, um, let's see. Let me go back to. Uh, can I? Am I still sharing my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's go back to that table of. Um, of indicators. Yeah, I, I think that's actually like a very nice question because mm -hmm. it's very important yeah. that um, you guys have a very good understanding. I think my my right. my ear my ear yeah, my earphone mm -hmm. just like died. Um, but I'm hoping you can still hear me. Um, it's very important that you that you have a good understanding of these two different terms because you know equivalence point is different from um, mm -hmm. endpoint mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. because like endpoint is just is related to your indicator as Dinti has actually said so if you pick the wrong indicator for a titration mm -hmm. experiment you might see um a, a change in the color before you reach the equivalence point so you're gonna get a wrong measurement measurement that's right that's yeah. right and there could also be times when Say if your um, indicator changes at a large excess of your titration, sometimes you would see the change in color way past the equivalence point. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that the equivalence point happens within the working range of your indicator. So for example, po, kung magtatitrate kayo ng sodium hydroxide at saka ng um, hydrochloric acid. So the products of uh, that acid-base reaction is just water, which is neutral, and sodium chloride, which is a neutral salt as well. So, dapat po, you would expect that at the equivalence point, kapag enough na yung amount ng hydrochloric acid and the amount of the sodium hydroxide, if that's equal, that's your equivalence point, you would expect a pH of 7 for that solution. So, you should pick an indicator that would change color within the, uh, within a pH range that covers 7. So, right. so, yeah. 
So I actually have a, had a slide of uh, different indicators at different yep. titration curves that I omitted, <laughs> but it will be yeah. available. <laughs> so, uh, so the titration curve actually can also be useful. So for example, uh, strong acid, strong base, um, you see the equivalence point region is from pH, uh, let's say four to 10. So normally you would, um, you would select the indicator that is within this, uh, this, sharp, this sharp change in pH right here. So you could also, so phenolphthalein is the common, but you can also uh, use a methyl orange for this type of uh, titration. And ito pong information na to, when it comes to indicators, these are all available online. It's, 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 these are very, these are searchable information. So mm -hmm. in case you know you're you have you're having second thoughts, if you're using the right indicator, Google Google mm -hmm. Google all these, you'll find the answer. Yeah. Yes. You can send us questions. You just <laughs> you're you mostly chemists. Yeah, you just need to know your working pH on the neutralization yeah. side or uh, on the equivalence point para That's ma. Right. Malaman natin yung appropriate na uh, yeah and I and Marty I think yeah I think I saw I saw a question earlier that's related to you know like pH my mom is calling I'm gonna have to <laughs> 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 uh, um so my question yata kanina bakit daw yung endpoint is not at neutral bakit daw basic or bakit daw acidic in some cases so eto siguro uh, doctor din di ako na lang yung sasagot this is like for the benefit of our high school and college students. So um, there are times that when you're doing acid-based titrations that the endpoint is say, on, a, in, in, on a basic uh, uh, pH range, so sometimes 9, sometimes 10. And that typically happens when you are um, titrating weak acids and bases. So for example, you have acetic acid and you're titrating it, say, with a strong base, um, say, sodium hydroxide, uh, for example. The product of that titration, um, so acetic acid and sodium hydroxide, you would form water and sodium acetate. So now the question is, when a weak acid reacts um, and undergoes acid-base reaction, the product of that is also a weak base. So what happens is, your weak base, which is your acetate ion, when that dissociates in, an, in, in water, in an aqueous environment, that will react with water, so it will abstract a proton from water and generate a hydroxide Ion. So the accumulation of those hydroxide ions from the um, weak a conjugate base that form, that's causing the pH to go high. So if you're if you're so if you're titrating strong acids with strong bases, you will get a neutral um, pH for the solution. But if you are if one of your comp components is either a weak acid or a weak base. Um, then you will have a non-neutral pH. So it's very important that you also know the strength, uh, the strengths of your acids and the products that they form. So yeah, the concept of weak acids and um, conjugate bases and weak bases and conjugate acids, that's something that you, that you have to be able to, to be familiar with. And also the concepts of chemical equilibrium, because you know, um, unless you're using a, a strong acid and base. Um, um, reactant pair, then you know you will always have to deal with the with these dissociation um, um, in aqueous phase of your um, conjugate acids and bases. So you're in That's place right. to watch. <laughs> yes. That's so correct. I guess, yeah, we missed uh, defining a uh, weak acid base or a strong acid and base. So that's a very good explanation. Yeah. Yep. All so, right. I mean, so I mean, like um, our, our intention for some of these webinars. So I mean, again, these are th this is. An overview, you know, this is an, an overview of, of ad, analytical techniques and, and um, instrumental um, um, analysis tec uh, techniques that are out there. So, you know, like hopefully later on, if we can like invite Dr. Dindu back, we can have um, <laughs> more focused discussions on certain topics. And, uh, yeah. He's been like, very generous and passionate to actually help out. And, you know, um, Marty, you mentioned that, you know, there are some students from Mariano Marcos University and other universities actually. Uh, the idea of this webinar just came about like, like sometime last week, right, Dindi? Um, if I may just like give you guys a background, so why don't we come up ng webinar na to? So some of those students from Mariano Marcos University who happen to be the students of a very good friend of mine who studied here in, in Houston, uh, they were checking out like some webinars, but um, you know, there's a fee 
and you know like obviously you know like times are tough right now so uh, you know like we I, i felt bad when 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 my friend mentioned to me that yeah they wanted to attend that in that um webinar but you know it's about like a thousand so uh, for for the registrations i was like okay perhaps i can tap into like some of my friends who are generous enough to share like their expertise and time so i reached out to dindi and it was like an immediate yes <laughs> Yeah. So right. within a week of preparation, she came up with a 131 slide presentation <laughs> for all of you guys. So um, hopefully, Dindi enjoys this experience and like um, hopefully she comes back. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we have like a bunch of very good friend uh, friends, <laughs> friends um, you know, like in, in in the STEM area, and you know, you'll see all these faces, you know, like getting involved in our. Endeavor. So thank you so much, Lindy. This is really I mean, <laughs> you're welcome. Questions, but you know I cannot, I cannot, you know I I I I, ha- I always have to express you know the gratitude because this is actually for those students. Like, you know, yes, they- definitely. Yeah. Yes, we have okay. a lot of BS chemistry students and chemical engineering students that are uh, saying hi in uh, the YouTube. Uh, YouTube uh, comment box. So there and, are a lot of uh, yeah. uh, undergrad like, students. Yeah. Hello, sa <laughs> This is also like the, one of the main missions of Pilsa you have. Um, you know, um, there's a bunch of us um, who fortunately have been, you know, um, blessed with fairly good career opportunities abroad. And we were trained in the Philippines. This is our only way of, you know, paying it forward. Mm-hmm. For next generation. You know, like, quite unfortunately, we, we ended up like set, getting settled here in the U.S., But you know, like we all have, we have, we now have all these platforms that enable for us to share everything that we have learned, you know, from from our years of experience um, um, in in the sciences. So, eto po mga bagay na to ibahatid po namin sa inyo in as much as possible for free. And if we can, ha- if, if if we can help out like in in other ways, please reach out to us po. Send us messages if there are like some topics that uh, would help you. Mm-hmm. Um. In, in your understanding of sciences, you know, not only for it in chemistry, um, we can we will try to find help. So we just need um yeah. your engagement. Um, send us your feedback and request, and we, I mean, when, whenever and wherever possible, we'll we'll try to we'll try to help you out. All right. So <laughs> let's. I- And that's that's the that's the goal and that's the vision of yes I have and now, uh, we will be going back to the Q and A part. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kasi ano alam niyo po ang alam alam niyo po ang dami po talaga ng mga kababayan natin na nasa US na ngayon or abroad na gusto talaga magshare ng knowledge nila through our uh, platform sa Filipino science app kasi gusto rin po nila matulungan yung mga students po natin here. So, uh, ito ma'am Dindi, we have a uh, lot of lots of questions actually. <laughs> Sige, so, we'll try uh, to answer that. Mm-hmm. How much daw po in weight will be the minimum amount? I think this is ang, ang gusto niya sabihin nito is of the sample. For instance, is required if we want to test for volatilization gravimetry. So, ano daw Siguro ano to limit of detection or sensitivity so, of the I, method. Yeah. yeah, no, I think he's just asking or that person is just asking about the amount. So depending on the monograph, eh, so specific uh, uh, compounds have what's called a um, monograph. Uh, usually, it's around um, two grams uh, of sample that you need for uh, for loss on drying. Nakita ko yung question earlier, so. <laughs> okay. All right. So it, ito naman po. Pero, yeah, very specific siya for, for the monograph, for the particular substance. Ayan. Ito po, siguro, clarification lang po. Color change or recognition seems to be subjective or qualitative. Siguro ito ay sa titrimetry. What mm-hmm. can we do to observe, uh, what can we do to observe quantitative information aside from pH? Can we use or add spectroscopy to the setup? Oh, napakayaman ng yeah. lab niyo kung dual test. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Pero <laughs> oh, para, oh, para, oh, para, oh, para, redan, <laughs> uh, oh, parang redundant na rin kasi if you do spectroscopy. Uh, so why not just use yeah, I mean, spectroscopy? Like, yep, I mean like I mean, if you can, you can, but it's not necessary. You okay. can only just yeah, yeah. go ahead, Jeff. 
So if you if you guys have learned in um how to do titrimetry tit- the right way, um by mm-hmm. that I mean you, you have your standardization of your solutions. Mm-hmm. I mean you're confident with the concentration of your titrant. You have very good weighing um skills. Mm-hmm. You have very good record keeping skills. Um, you know, the, the subjectivity of it, you know, it comes with practice. Po. So you know, like the more you do the titration, um the more uh, sensitive you'll be when it comes to you know figuring figuring out when am I nearing the equivalence point. You know, there, there's there's some some kind of chemical intuition that gets developed as you practice this more uh, and more. Mm-hmm. So you know, quite unfortunately, in in the classroom setting, um, a, a student will only have to do this you know once or twice per semester. So mm-hmm. it's very difficult to get them trained. So um, but th- I mean, most if you're a chemistry major. Um, you, um, you can um, have your practicum like in an analytical lab for mm-hmm. you to be able to get, to get exposed to more of these. But yeah, more than anything, po, more than the, the conceptual um, um, framework around it, you know, practice po is needed. Practice makes perfect. Mm-hmm. Practice po will yeah. make you an expert like uh, at, at at carrying out like all these um, experiments. And, you know, um, spectroscopy w- would actually be quite ideal, you know, like by all means, if you have... Um, uh, mm-hmm. That capability, you know, you can you can complement. Um, you, you, I mean, you, you can use it as a complementary technique to mm-hmm. um, say confirm, you know, like the, the progress of a particular reaction, whether it be your titrating, or you know wh- whether you're 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 inducing a, a precipitation. But yeah, I mean, um, titrimetry is is a fairly reliable um, technique mm-hmm. if you um, are, are if you have actually become like quite experienced um, at it. So, yeah. Do you have yeah. something to add, Ma'am Dindi? Do you have something to add, Ma'am Dindi? No. Um, well, titration requires a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in, I mean, initially you can uh, determine the equivalence point by calculations, diba. Right? So when you're yeah. close to that volume, then that's where you can uh, gradually, slowly add your titrant. Um, and like what Jeff said, uh, it takes a lot of practice. Um, para ma-develop yung, uh, yung titration technique mo. So, um, and, and then, you know, one very important thing po, there's a concept of back titration. So, that's right. <laughs> yeah, back titration. Ang so, you know, uh, ano, titration po may patawag yan. Um, some, yes. There are certain types of titration that if you overdo it, you can back titrate. So, you know, Again, if you know your your balance, if you have your balance chemical equation, if you understand the chemical reaction involved, there are ways to go around, you know, um, mishaps or image validation. We go consider natin. So, ang mga chemists po, hindi po yan laging perfect gumalaw. <laughs> By all means, I mean, you know, 15, <laughs> yeah, 15 years of... of New the Lord! Yeah, no, New the Lord! <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I was when I was taking up Chem thirty two, I mean, I I I mean, I I got I got I I I got a high mark for analytical chemistry, but that doesn't mean that I did all my titrations. Well, like I want to go back titrate. No, I just understood. I just understood the chemical reaction. Back titration, you hit it. You're good. Uh, that's why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why we sometimes extend the lab. It was six hours, yon. So, means an talaga ng mabig kung yung six hours. Yeah. 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 Hi you will not be, <laughs> yeah. You will not be a successful analytical chemist if you don't know how to back titrate. That's right. <laughs> perfect yeah. titration. <laughs> talaga ang ultimate test of patience because That's right. if you can put if you can put like a half drop, you know sometimes a half drop uh, in excess is enough to kind of like mess it up. So just That's right. Okay. That's let's right. just let's just put it into perspective. Ano ba kapag po kasi nalilito din yung nagtanong. Yun pong color change sa titration, hindi po natin minimeasure yung tingkad ng kulay na baka yun po yung gusto nyong sabihin dun sa... Oh, uh, uh, pwede, uh, baka, ah, hindi po. pwede siyang i-measure sa spectroscopy. Yeah, hindi po yun yung minimeasure natin, no? Ang minimeasure po <laughs> natin. Ano po ay, lang, ayun po ay pang signal lang na tapusin na ang reaction. Hindi po natin i-measure yung intensity ng kulay doon sa titration. Baka That's po right. kasi... Baka po um, kasi... Um, Okay. mali yung ano yung connotation natin dun sa ako. ang ating uh, pong measure sa titrimetry is 
kung yung amount ba ng ating um, si um, titrant ay equal na sa amount ng ating analyte um, on the context of a balanced chemical reaction. Exactly. Exactly. Yung po ang ating volume. Yung volume. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hindi, yeah. hindi natin, wala tayong pakialam dun sa kulay kasi yun ay signal lang natin. Kung yan man ay light pink, pero dapat light pink. So, <laughs> ideally po, ideally it should be light pink. Eh, kapag po sobrang naging colorless na, baka sumabra lang kayo ng konti. So there will be like some error. Yeah, so, some, some level of error um in in your measurement but i mean again kapag po kayo mag, do, mag whenever you're performing analytical measurements it's very important to run replicate so you don't only do it once and report your data so you know like uh, uh, an effective um analytical chemist would do things at least three times if yeah. you're running all these experiments for that's so, right Kapag po kayo pumalya, ang titration po ay parang buhay lang. Lagi may second chance. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Marty, for that ano clarification. Yes, kasi yes. feeling ko baka, ano, baka nalito sila na may intensity yeah. ng color doon sa ating mga titration yeah. na ginagawa. Lagi yeah. na pag may indicator. So yeah, in a way, it is, yeah, it is subjective. Pero yun nga, if you train your eyes and you have uh, patience and uh, the practice, then you can actually perfect the... Uh, the technique and and you know what sometimes okay this is also like one particular brute force technique that we do if you have enough of your reagents and of your samples sometimes for the first attempt it fails because you're just trying to get an idea of okay ilang ml ba nung titrant yung kailangan ko say for example if mapasobra ka but you have noticed that okay after 25 ml it has changed already then on your second trial you know when once you're at your 23rd ml You can do it like more slowly because alam mo no, alam mo na, na somewhere around that volume you're nearing the equivalence point. So may mga diskarte po diyan. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's move on uh, siguro mga two more uh, yes, questions sir. before we let go of Mom Dean. Uh, <laughs> yeah. kasi it's about 12 midnight na siguro sa you. Yeah, 11:30 <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh eto po mag uh, Is, is 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 it appropriate to use GCMS to determine the concentration of pesticide pesticide residues in food products or crops? Yes. 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 So normal. Uh, yeah, you can. Um, so there's a. Uh, they are called. They are considered semi-volatile, but uh, uh, volatile parin sila. So you can still use uh, GCMS for that. Yeah. Can you use GC alone? Um, well, you have to have a detector. Well, if you have <laughs> so normally, uh, for for pesticides, yeah, GC, GCMS is the is the tandem for uh, uh, for detection. But you can use your GCF ID or DCTC. Yeah, GCF ID as long as yeah. you have your standard. Your standards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at a good day, po. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Sure. Just want to ask if you could recommend a good software for spectroscopy like spectral analysis. That's very broad. Yeah. Sa MS kasi, if you have a detector, mayroon na minsan na it comes with the software. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Normally, it comes with the software na. So, wala, I, I can't really recommend anything. That's a very broad question. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it depends on the, on the yeah. equipment. That's they, right. They, mm-hmm. And there are yeah. there are uh, established libraries spe- especially for mass spec uh, data. So you mm-hmm. you just need to uh, access those libraries. Mm-hmm. That's right. Siguro yun ay sa MS no Sig- wala naman siguro. Ah, sa, F- sa FTIR ma'am, do you have any uh, for spectra- spectral analysis? Uh, Silver Stein. Ay, so fair. Wala ko. Hindi ko magamit Hindi kami gumagamit ng software sa IR kasi kaya <laughs> yung matamata lang. Matamata po. Matamata lang. Yeah. Uh, so, Marty, there's a question here and you might be able to answer this because you're in the Philippines. So, um, is there yeah. any institution in the Philippines that offers training for analytical techniques. So by the way, Marty po is a, a, a head of is the head of an analytical service lab. So marami din po yang alam. Oh, you know pala so, uh, Marty. Oh. <laughs> Go uh, for it. Uh, depende po kasi kung anong technique yung ipapaturo nyo. Like so if it's a specialized 
uh, method, like say for example, you're detecting some secondary metabolites, it's a specialized uh, training. So, inire-request po yan doon sa mga analytical services laboratory or pwede rin po sa FNRI and other government agencies na meron po ng mga equipment. So, it depends actually. You need to arrange the training and if the training size is uh, medyo marami or makas at least 10 or 5 kayo, that would be a go. So, you need an initial communication first with the public club. Oh, may, pwede rin private laboratories. Marami, rin, marami namang analytical laboratories na private. So you just need to communicate with them first because if you want to have a specialized training, kasi minsan uh, adept na tayo sa basic techniques. So we, we want to be trained dun sa mga specialized techniques na gusto natin talagang i-master. So yun po, initial communication muna kasi meron ding required number of trainees before mag-go ang isang training, lalo na sa mga analytical labs. So, meron, meron dito sa UPLB, meron ng ASL, alam ko nang training sila. Uh, ICASL ha, Institute of Chemistry ASL. Meron din po sa UP Dilema na ASL, uh, na, sa Institute of Chemistry din, pwede rin po sa FNRI and other agencies. Yun po, pu puro government yung alam ko, pero marami din pong uh, private na analytical laboratories na pwede kayong itap. Uh, yun. yun. Yun yung sa experience ko. Sa amin po, hindi po kami nag nagko-conduct ng training for uh, an outsider, for ano uh, in-house lang. Kasi maliit lang po yung ASL, ay analytical service lab ng institute namin. So for the Institute of Plant Breeding only because we specialized on crops. So yun. Uh, okay na? Meron pa. Ito po, po meron pa. Na. <laughs> Can I ask, ma'am, if the temperature if the temperature of a solution has the ability to alter the luminous intensity emitted and how it will affect the luminescence? Oh, okay. Hindi natin napag-usapan yan, ano? But, um, well, it depends on your, uh, your instrumentation. Uh, I mean, if you're going to ignite it or subject it to high temperature, then the temperature of the solution doesn't... If, if, he, if the person's asking about just the solution, the temperature of the solution before you introduce it to the instrument, um, kung isa subject mo siya sa high heat, then walang, wala masyadong effect, no? So, but uh, if it's at... Uh, it's at a lower temperature. Um, normally, temperature just uh, increases the uh, the flow rate, so uh, that's how it will affect the uh, the, the analysis. Yeah. So again, depend on ano yung operating range mo sa, sa instrument. Yeah. And, and so and, and perhaps like uh, if if that person is asking about say sample prep, right? Um, temperature mm -hmm. consideration. So depend po sa sample niya, no? Mahal right. yung temperature niyo hindi pala Yung, yung analyte. So that's going to cause a problem because you, you're you not sure that your the entirety of your analyte is, is within your liquid matrix. So things to watch out for. Po. Um, um, another thing, if you're dealing with thermally sensitive or yeah, thermally sensitive materials, then definitely you have to, you have to watch out for that. You know, like the temperature of your, of your, of your um, sample matrix has to be able to, um, you know, factor that in. Mm -hmm. But then again, so I mean, there's there's a lot there's a lot a lot of things to watch out. Things to watch out. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we will cut the discussion there because it's already twelve thirty and uh, it's almost lunch time for our participants. So uh, again, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Dindi Voiles for her generous time and expertise and sharing with us uh, all this knowledge that she has in analytical chemistry. So thank you po, ma'am. Again, let's give... You're welcome. Uh, Salamat. <laughs> thank you. Then, Dr. Dindi. <laughs> Sana may natutunan kayo from me. Before, <laughs> before, <laughs> oh, oh, before, before ka namin pakawalan, ma'am, do you have any message to the people who are watching now, especially to the students and to the teachers? Yeah. Um, so I guess for students, I don't know, marami kayong resources online. So grab grab those resources um and like before in in during my time back in the day <laughs> um library library <laughs> library library <laughs> 
Pero ngayon, you know, you have resources at your uh, fingertips. So utilize those. And um, uh, yeah, marami. Marami kayong matututunan sa analytical chemistry. And uh, there are many applications. So if you choose this, if you chose this career path, like if you want to be an analytical chemist, I assure you that lagi kayong may trabaho. <laughs> um, because there's always a need for uh, for analytical chemists in in many many industries so that's my encouragement to you guys and uh, for teachers uh, likewise you know marami tayong resources online um, uh, you can use those resources for more uh, you know to, to, to increase your creativity with uh, teaching and also um, yun nga uh, wag tayong matakot sa mga new uh, ways of, uh, of uh, teaching methods um, Yon, mag maging pasen pasensyo sa lang, kas lalo na if you're teaching titration uh, to your students. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's speaking of, right? I mean, right mm -hmm. now, they don't have access to the lab, so hindi nila mapapractice yeah. titration. Mm -hmm. But there are online resources that you can use to simulate titration. So mm -hmm. essentially, the, the students can um, um, go on. I, 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 I don't have the specific web. Websites, but there are websites out there where the students can virtually do the titration themselves for them mm -hmm. to experience it. But so, there are resources out there. So as as Dindi had actually mentioned, um, you just have to be quite patient and you have to scan your environment. There are yeah. uh, free resources out there that you can use um, for this. I mean, like for now, I mean, like after this, the the lecture that Dindi delivered, it's gonna be immortalized um on the worldwide. <laughs> immortalized. <laughs> No, because it's all the good and bad thing. <laughs> yeah, you can you can you can revisit, you can revisit the talk. I, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you wanna, I'm, I'm, for a refresher course, I have to say it's been ages since I, I, you know, I I I heard discussions about the other types of chromatography and your spectroscopic uh, techniques. So like I mean, for someone like me, um, who have not really been practicing analytical technique much. Um, over the past years, then you know, mm -hmm. this is a very good refresher. Um, for me. So thank you so much, Cindy. You're welcome. And Thank always you, support yeah. Phil's Sci Hub. Um, <laughs> silang, ano, platforma. <laughs> silang activities here. So uh, just stay stay tuned. <laughs> Marami pong plan. Then they also yeah. some of the plans. Um, both, um, <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma'am Dindi. Uh, Kuya Jeff, can you share your screen for the yeah. announcement? <laughs> Uh, by the way, the evaluation forms are already posted in the Zoom chat box and also in the YouTube comment section. So if uh, just fill out the form and we will be giving you your e-certificate. So before we end this, uh, we end this uh, webinar, we would like to invite you to our next webinar that will be happening two weeks from now. So... We are Jeff will discuss. Just give me a sec. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you will discuss about this uh this webinar. Yeah. Okay. So again, si Mam Din Dipo is uh, very thankful kami kasi grabe talaga yung dedication. Imagine niyo po, 130. Uh, one week lang po yan. Um, when I, <laughs> yeah, when I mentioned to Dindi that there are students who really wanted to um attend um um um. A virtual analytical um, chemistry webinar um, for a fee. Um, you know, um, you know, it, it touched her heart, and yeah, she She actually um, said yes immediately to our to our to our request for for this lecture. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Martin. So yeah, thank you for staying up <laughs> till midnight because uh, past bed bedtime na po to ni Martin. <laughs> Walang ano man, nakakape ako eh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, yeah, Jeff, can you invite them? Ayun po, uh, uh, two weeks from now, um, research proposal writing. So, dun po sa mga uh, kulang pa sa training when it comes to this, sa so, mga walang idea kung paano ba ang pag, uh, effective na pagsulat ng research proposal and pag-present, pag pag-pitch ng research ideas, ito po ay lecture and workshop at the same time. So we highly encourage um, all the teachers and students out there to participate um, um, in this event. And then, yeah, we're going to be launching um, Phil Sci Hub's Lions then. So yung po yung aming 
um, virtual competition for the best um, research, uh, science investigatory project idea. So, yun po yung magkakaalaman na kung sino matatapang sa Pilipinas na magka-come up ng ideas to present to our um, panel of, of judges po. So, things to watch out for. And then, um, as we mentioned, um, a month fr um, from that date, uh, Marty will be the will be sharing some ideas on research topics that you can um, investigate at the comforts of your home or within your community. Kasi alam po namin wala kayo ngayong access sa uh, laboratory resources. So um, gagamitan po yan ni Marty ng um, uh, kanyang um, sense of creativity um, para po mapigyan kayo ng idea. Ano ba yung mga pwede nyo gawin? Uh, ngayon naman hindi kayo nakakapasok sa school or sa inyong mga laboratorio. And then... Um, Meron lang po ako dong um, supplementary um, session on the brainstorming exercise. So, how do you manage a large set of ideas and how can you actually identify um, the single most um, promising idea? So, paano nyo ba ipaprioritize yung ideas ninyo if you're working on, 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 on research ideation as a group? So, yun po yung mga ide-deliver po namin sa inyo. Marami, and then, in the March, month of March po, marami pa po kami mga mga webinars na i-announce. So, keep checking um, uh, out for announcements uh, sa amin pong website, www.fellsihub.com and then sa amin pong official Facebook page. And then we also post our uh, video announcements and teasers po sa amin YouTube channel. So, um, subscribe po kayo um, and then um, yeah, that way um, you'll, you'll know if we have like some new contents released um, um, quite um, often. Uh, every, 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 every quite often. So, yun po. Maraming maraming salamat po ulit sa pagsama po sa amin at sa pagtutok. Um, um, medyo na-overlap, naka-overlap po sa inyong lunchtime. So, hopefully po ay ma-enjoy po ninyo ang uh, natitira oras na inyong uh, pananghalian and then yung pong again sabi po ni Marty kanina yung link po to the Google form um it's it's already posted on the YouTube chat box and also on on the Zoom chat box so and then um yung uh, Google form po nandun po sa website namin so you can check uh, check check that out um, um for you to get your certificate of participation so yung po muli maraming maraming salamat right. po and Dr. Yeah. Dindi Hopefully, this is the start of, you know, hopefully, um, you know, more <laughs> lectures in the future, you know, like whenever your time permits. Um, it's, it's really a great pleasure and we're, we're, we're really blessed by, by the wisdom and, you know, and, and all these materials that you um, thoughtfully prepared for, for, for the Filipino, uh, you know, uh, teachers and students. So, yung oh, marami, marami, salamat po. And then, um, yeah, um, oh, JP, 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 JP came back. <laughs> His, his computer retted. We were quite, you know, yeah, we, we were having panic attacks like earlier because we thought that we we're going to be losing the live stream. So good thing that didn't happen. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. And then, um, at the end, we're just going to have like a debriefing like, amongst the four of us like after the session. We'll send you a separate Google uh, Zoom link, Zoom session information. Yeah. Maraming maraming so, salamat uh, po eh. Marty? Yeah, th thank you so much, everyone, especially to those who stayed with us. We have a total of around, around 600 50 at max viewers during the peak of the discussion. Maraming salamat po for staying with us. And stay tuned for more offerings of Phil Sci Hub. You can follow us on Facebook, Filipino Science Hub, YouTube, Phil Sci Hub, and our website, philsci-hub.com. So with that, have a happy lunch, everyone, and have enjoy your weekend, everyone. Ma'am Dindi, we will have a separate Yeah. Thank you, Paul, and have a happy weekend. Yep.